Welcome to the Third Road Tesla podcast. My name is Safian Fraval, and today we have a very special guest. But before I introduce our special guest, I'm going to go through and introduce our crew. So our regular Third, third Road Tesla podcast crew. So today we have Omar Kazi, Tesla Truth. Boom. <laughs> and we have Kristen from Hi. K10. <laughs> Thank you. And we got Vincent Yu from Tesmanian. Hi. All right, great. And then we got Galileo Russell from Hyperchange. What up, third row? And then we got Viv, for, who's uh, Falcon Heavy. Hey. Great. All right, Omar, do you want to introduce our guest? Please welcome the inventor of the car fart, Elon Musk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Please put that on my gravestone. <laughs> Love it. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy that we're actually all here. And um, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, you're welcome. We're all Tesla customers, fans, and... It's really good that it's finally happening. And I remember um, that I was looking at your Wikipedia tweet. Um, that it's like this bizarre, fictionalized version of reality. Yeah. And uh, I replied to him, like, why don't you come on a podcast and like tell your fictionalized version of reality? Sure, exactly. <laughs> I tell my fictionalized version. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you replied, okay, sure. And I was kind of like taken by surprise by that. And um, you know the way you engage and listen to your customers online. Yeah. It's like. I've never seen anything like that from, you know, CEO of a public company or sure. any executive. So can you tell us a little bit where that came from, why you communicate directly instead of like having this PR strategy that most companies have? Sure. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it started out, I actually had one of the very, very first Twitter accounts, like when it was like less than 10,000 uh, people. And, I th and, and then everyone was tweeting at me, like, what kind of latte they had at Starbucks. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, well, this seems like the silliest thing ever. <laughs> so I deleted my Twitter account, and then <clears throat> uh, someone else took it over and started tweeting in my name. Uh, <laughs> oh, <not good. laughs> yeah. Um, and, and then a couple of uh, friends of mine, um, well, Lee and Jason Calacanis, said, they both said, hey, you should really use Twitter to get your message out um, and also some somebody's tweeting in your name and they're saying crazy things so I was like, I'll say crazy things in my name uh, <laughs> did you have to pay them no no they they they, they um, I, I'm not sure who it was but it was for some reason I, I don't know I got my account back great and um, and, and then I was just I, I don't know it's some degree it's like uh, just sort of I just started tweeting for fun really and my, my early tweets were quite crazy uh, as I was trying to explain, like it has the arc of insanity is is short uh, in that it's not very steep because it started off insane, <laughs> and so if it's still insane, it's you know it hasn't changed that much. Um, so um, yeah, and, and I don't know. It, it seemed it seemed kind of fun to. You know, as I think I've said this before, it's like, you know, some people use their hair to express myself, I use Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you like Twitter so much? I mean, you could use Instagram, as for example. As opposed to other but platforms. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, like, I don't trust Facebook, obviously, you know, and... and <laughs> And then Instagram is is fine, but it's I, I think not exactly my style. Um, it's hard to convey a, a, a sort of intellectual arguments on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard on Twitter too, but it's uh, but you can't uh, you know it's so uh, Instagram is also owned by Facebook, and so I was like, eh. <laughs> yeah, um, deleted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just deleted it. It's like I don't really need to just if I need to say something, I only really need to say it on one platform, pretty much. And um, so, and, and so if I'm trying and, and I don't want to spend too much time on social media, so it's just like okay, I'll, if, if if people want to know what I'm saying, then they can just sort of go to Twitter. You know, I'll just keep doing that as long as Twitter is good, I suppose, more good than bad. Um, yeah, crypto scammers are really. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that they've been yeah. taking advantage of Vincent recently. Yeah, I know. Really? Yeah, yeah. there's like ten Vincents out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, they totally they yeah. copy everything and just like change one. Yeah, they thing. use my avatars and then the picture and then they just post like right below. Yeah. Your tweet, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow. 
Yeah. And they block me too. We fight them <laughs> all all, t- all the time. We're always like reporting them. Like every day we report like every 10 day, people. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have so many like, yeah, exactly conversations on Twitter. Like, come on, <laughs> can you just like? I think it would take like three or four customer service people to just mm-hmm. look look at this. It's crypto scam. Block it. It, it should be easy. It should be easy. It should be easy. Um, but then, like, my wife, Vegan Shelley, I think you liked her tweet the other day. Um, she got banned for like replying to one of your tweets and quoting like the video inside of it. And then she got suspended for like a day or something. I was like, what the heck <laughs> is, is going strange. on? Yeah. yeah. So it's just weird how the algorithm works. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a lot of manipulation, but you know, going back to the Wikipedia page, you know, it's kind of interesting. Just sure. what a decade you've had. I remember I was reading somebody's article. I think they interviewed you in 2009 or something like that. And they said, you know, if you had met Elon Musk in 2009, right after the recession, they're like struggling with the roadster, you know, you never would have thought that you are where you are today. You're, you know, launching astronauts into space. We will be, hopefully. Well, yeah. Hope, yeah, this year, you know, servicing the International Space Station. I mean, Tesla with the Model 3, the Model Y, you know, electrification really. Yeah. Without Tesla, it would not be where it is today. You see where the other legacy automakers are. They're not doing great. So, you know, looking at kind of like this, like you've, you've become this legendary figure and looking at kind of like how people kind of see you, kind of the Ashley Vance biography or Wikipedia page, what is it that really kind of sticks out to you or, you know, makes you laugh? Like that's just completely <laughs> off base. Yeah. Um, well, I think I mentioned that the, that uh, I kept getting referred to as an investor in, yeah. in like a bunch of things. And it's like, but I actually don't invest really, except in companies that I help create. So I only have the only publicly traded share that I have at all is Tesla. I have no diversity uh, on, on publicly traded shares. Just like us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nothing. So, um, and um, you know that's quite, quite unusual. So uh, you know, almost everyone you had diversify to some degree. Um, and then the only stock that I have of significance outside of Tesla is SpaceX, which is privately, which is a private, you know, private corporation. Um, and, um, and and then <clears throat> in order to uh, um, get liquidity, which is mostly to reinvest in SpaceX and Tesla, um, and occasionally in like uh, pro- provide funding for sm- much smaller projects like Neuralink and Boring Company, uh, then I'll I'll actually take out loans against. The Tesla and SpaceX stock. Um, so, the so what so what I actually have is is whatever the, my Tesla and SpaceX stock is, and then there's about a billion dollars of debt against that. Mm-hmm. So, um, which, which you know it's it's th- th- this is sort of taken to imply that I'm claiming that I have no money, which I'm not claiming. <laughs> 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 but I'm it, it's 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 to make it clear that you'll see some like number some big number in like Forbes or something people will think I have the te- the Tesla and SpaceX stock and I have the cash Mm-mm. and I'm being somehow just, I'm just sitting on the cash yeah. doing nothing <laughs> and I'm like hoarding resources I'm like <laughs> no it's, it's you know the only alternative would be to say okay let's give the stock to the government or something and then the government would be running things and the, the government just is not good at running things that's the main thing um I think there's like like a fundamental sort of question of like consumption versus capital allocation. Um, this is probably gonna get me into trouble, but uh, the 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 paradigm of say com- communism versus capitalism, I think, is fundamentally um, sort of orthogonal to the reality of uh, of, of 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 actual economics in in, in, in some ways. So. Uh, what you actually care about is like the responsiveness of the feedback loops to the maximizing happiness of the population. Um, and if, if more resources are controlled by entities that have poor response in their feedback loops. So if, if it's like a monopoly corporation or a small oligopoly or in the limit, I would say like the a monopolistic corporation in the limit is the government. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, it's just it's it's. This is not to say people who work with the government are bad. If those if those same people are taken and put in a, in a better sort of operating system situation, the outcome will be much better. Um, so, it, it's really just what is the responsiveness of the organization to maximizing the happiness of the people, um, and um, and and so you want to have a, a competitive situation where it's truly competitive. Uh, where companies aren't gaming the system, um, and uh, and then where the rules are set correctly, um, and and then you need to be on the alert for regulatory capture, where the the referees are in fact captured by the players, um, which is you know and and the the players should not control the referees, you know essentially, yes. which which can happen, um, you know I think like that happened for example with uh, I think the zero emission vehicle mandate in in California. Uh, where um, California was like really strict on EVs, and then they the, the car companies managed to sort of, frankly in my view, tr trick the uh, regulators into into saying okay, you don't need, you don't need to be so hardcore about the EVs, and instead you say say fuel cells of the future, mm -hmm. but fuel cells are of course many years away, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> forever. <laughs> so, so then, so then they, they let up the let the, the rules, and then. You know, GM recalled the EV1 and crushed them in, in, in exactly. like yeah. a junkyard, was which awful. was against the wishes of the yeah. owner. I mean, they they uh, all lined up to buy them, and they wouldn't let them buy them. Uh, well, I mean, Chris Payne did this great documentary on it, and yeah. it's like the you know the, the owners of the of the EV1, which by the way wasn't actually that great of a car, <laughs> but they still wanted the electric car so bad mm -hmm. that they held a candlelit vigil at the junkyard where their cars were crushed. Oh wow! It, like it, like it was like a like a prisoner being executed or something like that. <laughs> yeah. That was literally. I know. And, and like, so when painful. is the last time you even heard of that for a product? Right. You know, GM is stops the product. I mean, what? <laughs> I mean, listen, man, they're not doing that for any other GM product. Yeah. <laughs> no. Have you thought about doing the EV two? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. it's kind of sometimes hard to get through these guys. You know, so anyway, I think that's a very important thing. Um, so generally, we could see like these oligopolies forming, uh, or uh, duopolies, the, the, um, and then you get effective price fixing, and then they, they cut back on the R and D budget, like a, a kind of a silly one, frankly, it's like like candy, like there's a there's a candy oligopoly, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like when's the we don't see much innovation in candy. So you're still working on the candy company. Crypto candy, is that? <laughs> boring candy. Boring candy. What's boring the, candy? It's going to be boring candy. I, I haven't seen a candy yet that's good enough to <laughs> send out. But, um, and it's, yeah. Uh, but I, th I think it, it's, it's there's, there's like three companies or something that control all the candy in the world pretty much. It's crazy. Uh, and dog food. <laughs> yeah. There's somebody constructed like this, it's this, crazy conglomerate and and it's like and it's like dog food and baby food and candy and it's like all you know all the brands a rendering yeah you, hundreds of brands yeah you think you're buying from different companies but yeah. it all funnels up to like three companies wow. or something like that don't send the rendering food to the candy company <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah big candy <laughs> so you, you want to have like a good competitive forcing function so that uh, you have to make the product better uh, or or you'll lose like if you don't make the product better and 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 improve the product for the end consumer then then that company should have relatively less prosperity compared to a company that makes better products um, now, now the car industry you know is, is actually pretty competitive mm -hmm. uh, so that's good um, and uh and, but and so then the, but the, the good thing about a competitive comp industry is then if, if you make a, a product that's better, it's going to do better in the marketplace. Mm. Definitely. So, yeah. uh, this, this is Gene Wilder's old house. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. It's amazing. Photos over there. It's, it's lovely. Thanks for having us here as yeah, well. Thank you. It's really special. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a cool spot. Yeah. And it's got a solar glass roof. Yeah. Oh, you, you see that? Portion yeah. two, right? We didn't notice it, but yes. then we checked it out the second time. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for my uh, three. So, I, I'm waiting for version three. Well, whatever is they're going to put on, I don't care. Uh, just, give me version three. Yeah. Yeah. Looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, we saw it at the store in Torrance, actually. They've got yeah. it in the stores now. Yeah. looks really good. Well, the, 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 it's in, actually designed such that you don't notice it. <clears throat> so, he's like this, look at this old house. This is like, a, it's an old house. I don't know, probably 50 years old, something like that. And, and it's quite quirky. So, if you put something on that was like, 
that d- didn't blend in that it, it would it would not look right it would be pretty straightened and um this had a black comp shingle roof so i was like okay let's see if we can actually have it w- weave in and still feel natural look good and yeah um and i think it's it's sort of achieved that goal um but yeah, this is a lovely, quirky little house. I'll show you around okay. afterwards. It's got all sorts of weird things. Is it's exactly it what. Lloyd sorry. Is it Frank Lloyd? Right. No, I I don't think so. <laughs> I think it was just built in increments over time by probably several people. Um, but they, they they would have just knocked it down and built a giant house here. So it's like so glad they didn't. Yeah, it's super cool. It's really right? amazing. So, Gene Wilder is one of my favorite mm-hmm. uh, actors, actually. So. It's great, movie, yeah. awesome movies. So, so when when you come up with a product like the, the solar glass roof, I think a lot of people misunderstand that like your goal is to bring these crazy technologies to market and really create a change in the world. Yeah. And so I think it's fascinating that you do it through companies, and it seems like the fastest way to create that feedback loop and to really like get go from inventing something to millions of people using it right away. Yes. So like like I, it seems like buying a Tesla is almost like the best thing you could do to help the climate crisis because you're like turbocharging R&D and products and innovation. I, I feel like not enough people really understand that. Um, yeah, that, <clears throat> that, that is, I think there's lots of good things people can do for the climate, but just generally anything that is um, moving towards sustainable energy, um, it, whether it's, it's sustainable energy, create, um, um, generation through solar <clears throat> or with an electric vehicle um, actually just th- just things like better insulation in a house just is, is really um, effective for energy consumption um, but but if I find oh geez Marvin <laughs> it's ingratiating that's Marvin the motion oh I actually got him a little um, for Halloween a little Knitted Marvin the Martian cap. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so he had the little, you know, the helmet with yeah. the. It looked super cute. You got enough, buddy. <laughs> so, did you always know, like, you know, business was the way you wanted to kind of attack attack these problems versus, say, you know, maybe a nonprofit or you know, working as a college professor or something? I don't know. Uh, well, when I was in in high school, I thought I would most likely be doing physics at a particle accelerator. <laughs> So that's what I was, um, if physics and computers, I mean, I got distinctions in two areas in physics and computer science, and those were, those were yeah, so my two best subjects. And, uh, and then I thought, okay, well, that, I want, I want to figure out what's the nature of the universe. And um, so, I, you know, go try to work on with people, banging particles together, see what happens. Um, and, um, and then it, it sort of things went along, and the, the superconducting super collider got cancelled in the U.S. And that actually was like, whoa, you know, what if I am working at a collider? It's been all these years, and then the government just cancels it. Wow. And then that would I was like, I'm not going to do that. So, um, so it's like, so my, my, my well, we roll, roll back a little. Um, like I was trying to figure out what, when I was a kid, I had like this existential crisis, and I was about twelve years old or something, and and I was like, well, what does the world mean? What's it all about? We're living some meaningless existence, mm-hmm. and and then um, I made I made the mistake of reading Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, and, <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> don't do that. Not a, not a, not a, it means a bit older, I think. No, no, and actually, lately, these days, I sort of reread it. So I was like, you know, it's actually, he's not that bad. I mean, he's, yeah. he's got issues, he's got issues, <laughs> no question about it. But, but you know, it's, anyway. Um, so, uh, but then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams, uh, which, was, which is like quite a really, quite a good book on philosophy, I think. And uh, I was like, okay, we don't really know what the answer is, obviously. Uh, so, but the universe, the universe is the answer. And that really, what are the questions we should be asking to better understand the nature of the universe? And so then to the degree that we expand the scope and scale of consciousness, um, then we'll better be able to answer the, ask the questions um, and understand the why we're here or what, what it's all about. Mm. And so we should sort of take the set of actions that are most likely to result in us understanding what questions to ask about the nature of the universe. Um, 
so the so therefore we, we we must propagate uh, human civilization on Earth as far into the future as possible, um, and become a multi-planet species to again extend the scope and scale of consciousness and incre- increase the probable lifespan of of um, consciousness, which is going to be, I think, probably a lot of machine consciousness as well in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, that's the best we can do, basically, you know, and w- w- yeah, that's the best we can do. So, um, you know, in thinking about the, the various problems that we're facing or, or what would most likely change the future, um, the when they were in college, there were sort of five things that I thought would be... Um, I mean, I thought these were actually these, these, these. I would not regard this as a profound insight, but rather an obvious one. Uh, or the you know, the internet would fundamentally change humanity because it's it's like uh, humanity would become more of a superorganism because the internet is like the nervous like a nervous system. Mm. Um, now suddenly, any part of the human human, human organisms anywhere would have access to all the information Amazing. instantly. Neuralink. Hey, well, I can imagine if you, if you didn't have a nervous system, you wouldn't know what's going on. Your fingers wouldn't know what's going on. Your toes wouldn't know what's going on. It, it'd have to do it by diffusion. Oh, uh, gosh. And, uh, yeah, and the way information used to work was really by diffusion. One human mm-hmm. would have to call another human. Or, 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 or actually or go write there. them. <laughs> yes, yeah. like if it was a, and a letter. Uh-huh. <laughs> you'd have to write a letter. You'd have to hand that letter to another human. That would be carried through a bunch of things. Find another person would give it to you. Inefficient. Extremely slow diffusion. Hmm. Um, and if you wanted access to books, if you were not did not have a library, you were not, you don't have it. That's it. Right. So um, now you have access to all the books instantly. Um, and you, you, if you can be in a remote, like you know, mountaintop jungle location or something, and have access to all of humanity's information, if you've got a link to the internet, this is a fundamental, profound change. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I was on the internet early because of, of you know in the physics community that was pretty normal. Although his uh, interface was, you know, almost entirely text and hard to use. Mm-hmm. Um, but <clears throat> um, that, 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 that another one would be obviously making life multiplanetary, making consciousness multiplanetary, um, the uh, um, changing uh, human g- genetics. Um, which obviously I'm not doing, by the way. <laughs> uh, it, there's a thorny subject, um, but it, it is being done with CRISPR and others. You know, it would, it, it will, it will become normal to, to, I think, to change the human genome. It will become normal. Like, what's the opportunity? Like, why is that something that's inevitable? Or, well, you know, I think for for sure, as far as say, um, getting rid of diseases or propensity mm-hmm. to various diseases, then you'd, that that's gonna be like the first. Thing that you'd want to edit out, you know. So it's like if you've got like your, you know, a situation where you're definitely going to die of some kind of cancer at age 55, you prefer to have that edited out. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think you know, it's just edit that out. It, 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 you know, there's the, the, the Gattaca sort of extreme thing where it's not merely edited out, but it's like it's edited in for various enhancements and that kind of thing, uh, I, which probably will come too. But I'm, I'm not saying. You know, you know, arguing for or against it, I'm just saying this: the more likely to come than not uh, down the road. Yeah. So then, and then AI, um, the really major one. So these are all big motivational factors you know, to you know, yeah. keep our consciousness going. Oh, and, and it's, it's sustain, sustainable. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so sustainable energy. So sustainable energy actually was something that. I thought it was important before the environmental implications became um, as obvious as they they are. It's simply because if, if if you mine and burn hydrocarbons, then you're going to run out of them because mm-hmm. um, you. It, it's it's not like it's not like by mining sort of say metals, for example. If you if you you know the, we we recycle steel um, and aluminum and uh, because that's just it's. It's, it's not a change of energy state. Whereas if you if you take fossil fuels, you're taking some some from a high energy state, converting it to a lower energy state like CO two, uh, which is extremely stable. You know. So whereas we will never run out of metals, not a problem. Um, we will run out of of mined hydrocarbons, um, and then necessarily, if, if we have got billions, ultimately trillions of tons of 
hydrocarbons that were buried deep underground in solid liquid or gas form, whatever, but they're deep underground. You say you sort of move them from deep underground to the oceans and atmosphere, you will have a change in the chemistry of the uh, of the surface, obviously. Um, and the, then there's just a certain probability associated with well, how bad will that be? Um, and the range of possibilities goes from mildly bad to extremely bad. Uh, but then why would you run that experiment? That seems yeah. like the craziest experiment question. ever. Especially since we have to go to sustainable energy anyway. <laughs> why, why would you yeah. run that experiment? This is yeah. just the, the maddest thing I've ever heard. I'm not saying there shouldn't be some use of hydrocarbons on Earth, but there just should be have the, have a, the correct price pl place on CO2 production. Mm -hmm. and, and the obvious thing to do is have a, CO, a carbon tax. It's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Every, if, I don't know, the 90 plus percent of economists would say this, and I think of physicists, and it's just... The you know the mock system works well if you've got a, the right price on things. It's very very simple. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you've got a price of zero, uh, effectively or very low, then it's um, well people will behave accordingly. So so it's just that's that's the thing that needs to get done. I think it will get done. Um, and and then the, the if, if over time as you raise the the price on on carbon. You can actually, I think, in, encourage uh, sequestration technologies over time, mm -hmm. um, and, and and there'll be a lot of innovation in that regard, and, and that's the right way to do it. So you had these <clears throat> realizations about you know areas of big value, and you went and started Zip2, you sold it, got you know twenty million cash. <clears throat> you were the largest shareholder at pay, of PayPal at the time. eBay acquired it. I think you know you got hundred. 60 million or something yeah. like that uh you know you have enough money basically for an entire lifetime why go and put your money into spacex which is a huge you know risky operation or tesla why not just kind of you know relax <laughs> sure what so yeah basically um you know i i graduated from 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 penn with basically physics and, and economics um, and uh, then <clears throat> at, we acted a road trip to uh, to Stanford uh, with with Robin Wren who is in my physics class um, and now works at Tesla actually <laughs> um, that's cool yeah and he grew up in Shanghai yeah so that's cool. uh, yeah he's a very smart guy he ended up continuing at Stanford and I ended up going on deferment a couple days into the semester but I, I was going to be studying um, material science and the, the physics of high energy density capacitors for use in electric vehicles. So, so the intent was, I was going to go, okay, I'm going to work on energy storage solutions for um, electric vehicles. And I'd worked at a company at called Pinnacle Research for a couple summers that did high, um, high energy density capacitors. I was going to try to do effectively like a solid state version of, of what they were doing with um, uh, uh, yeah, it's going to get very complicated from a technical standpoint, but they were using a ruthenium, ruthenium tantalum oxide. Ruthenium is extremely rare and expensive. You cannot scale that. So, it's like, can, can you find a substitute for ruthenium? But we're able to get to uh, energy density is comparable to lead acid battery, but with incredibly high power density. So, well, what do you want uh, a I can uh, go down a deep rabbit hole there, but. What's the purpose <laughs> of a supercapacitor in an EV? An ultra capacitor. No, I think with the advent of uh, high-energy lithium-ion batteries, a capacitor is not not the right path. What was your thinking back then, though, that made you think it could be useful for EVs? I wanted to use um, advanced chip-making equipment uh, to make capacitors that were precise at a molecular level. Um, so at the, you know, just a level of precision that, that was sort of unheard of in, in capacitors. Like, capacitors' energy is a function of its area. Or, and, and a separation distance. So if you have, if you can have very tiny separation distance, um, and you can, and you can inhibit quantum tunneling, like I so said, how do you, things get pretty esoteric? <laughs> so you got to inhibit quantum t tunneling, get a very short gap, um, um, and and then you, could, in theory, get to very high energy densities you, um, by making capacitors in the way that you would make a. a uh, an, an x86 processor um, and since there's there, there were tens of billions of dollars going into chip making R&D 
that I thought there might be a way to make an advanced capacitor using chip making equipment inst instead of the conventional means. So is it off the table, ultra capacitor? It's unnecessary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. It's unnecessary. It, it, it's, it, it's, it, I think, I think it's, I think it's probably as physically possible, but it's, it's unnecessary at this point. I mean, I know a lot of people were talking about Maxwell, and they had been working on some stuff with capacitors. But the, the funny thing is that when I was doing the um, my internships at uh, this uh, advanced capacitor company called Pinnacle Research, which was in Las Gatas, we, we talked a lot about Maxwell, mm -hmm. and, and Maxwell was also trying to make high-energy density capacitors. Now, Tesla acquired Maxwell. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. it's amazing. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. We're looking That's forward so to that investor day. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Great to know. Maxwell has a bunch of technologies that are that that where if they're applied in the right way, I think can be have a, a very big impact. Like the dry electrode stuff. That would be one of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's a big deal. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Much much bigger deal than it may seem. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, it, and there's like, a few other things with with the uh, the space that it takes up for the ovens that you know for the current technology you can save all that that real estate space now that's one aspect and the cost reduction the weight savings I mean there's so many pluses right yes I mean there's many things there but uh, I'll have to wait until you know whatever battery day sure uh, which is you know hopefully in a few months but I, I think we've got some pretty exciting things to share um, so. Yeah. Galley's very excited. Yeah, it seems like the, the pace of the innovation of the, the battery thing has just taken off. Like since you guys have more capital and being able to like have the Gigafactory be vertically integrated just seems like no other car company is making that many batteries. So they're not even thinking about what comes next. But that huge they're not event, even, you know, I, man, not even, uh, <laughs> not even come close at all. I can 201 miles. No, not, not even. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, it's yeah. true. Uh, the other car companies just really want to outsource battery te technology. Not, not even not even making the like the, this battery module and cell, uh -huh. um, but they're they're obviously outsourcing the cells, but even yeah. outsourcing the modules and the packs. Yeah, you know, and and it's like they're really not thinking about fundamental chemistry improvements. And there's some pretty deep wizardry at Tesla on this front. I, I should say a bit about like like electric vehicles and 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 so, or sustainable energy in general. Uh, you know, I so said it, it was it, it was pretty. I think obvious to not not just me to me, but to a lot of people, maybe even go back thirty years or, or longer, that we must have uh, a sustainable energy solution. In fact, it's it's total logical. If it's un if it's if it's uh, if it's not sustainable, we must at some point find an alternative to it. Mm -hmm. And so, even if there were no environmental impact to uh, the sort of a fossil fuel economy, then it, we would run out of them, and then we'd have economic collapse and. Mm -hmm. Well, civilization would fall apart. Yes. So, so that, that that was actually my initial motivation for electric vehicles. It's like, okay, we've got to have a solution that does not require um, mining hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 is sustainable to, in the long term. It, 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 it was not actually initially from an environmental standpoint because I did not realize the gravity of the environmental situation at that time. Um, and I thought actually. For sure, by now we'd have electric cars. Like for sure, but are we back on the moon? Yeah, yeah, totally. Why are we not back on the moon? Exactly, it's yeah. insane. It is insane. <laughs> <laughs> if you said told somebody in '69 that yeah, that we'd not be back on the moon, and in like 2020, they'd be like, oh, you probably you might have gotten punched, honestly, because they'd be like, yeah. you're just it's a, it's like ins so insultingly rude to the future. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> they'd be like, "What is wrong with you?" Yeah, it's encouraging. Course, SpaceX is encouraging, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like we should have a share of a base on the moon. We should have sent people to Mars. None of that's occurred. You know, it's got to. That's we've got to make that happen. Yeah. So, so, but on the sustainability front, it was really, like I said, it not so much, initially not so much from an environmental standpoint, but from um, an, a necessity of, of replacing a finite resource um, mm -hmm. in order to ensure that civilization could continue to grow. And then the urgency of it became much more obvious, like, wow, we really better do something because uh, the environmental stuff is becoming quite serious. Um, and the, the, the inertia of large existing companies is just hard to appreciate. They just mm -hmm. want to keep doing the same thing mm -hmm. and maybe 5% different every year, maybe 5% different. Um, 
the big companies hate change. So, um, so then the, you know, at the time that Tesla, you know, was, was created, we, you know, there was no, no one was doing electric cars. No, there weren't really startups. There weren't the big car companies weren't doing it. Uh, GM and Toyota canceled their EV programs. And now everybody's doing it right now. Like, Everybody, and their mom. Everybody's talking mom. about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Right? Everyone and their mom is doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and we would all like to congratulate about the Gigafactory 3. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's Epic. amazing. Yeah. And I would like to know, like, why China is the best country to build the first foreign Gigafactory? Yeah, China is the biggest um, consumer mm-hmm. of cars in the world. So uh, it's... Uh, so that 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 alone would be enough to do it. Um, I think also there was a lot of uncertainty about uh, tariffs, and and you know, it's like we potentially would be unable to sell effectively in China if we did not have a factory locally. Yes. Uh, or at least unable to sell at prices that weren't extremely high. But those are really the two two main Same reasons. reasons. Um, I think that. Um, but I think there's also a third important reason that that there's just so much uh, talent um, and drive in China that I think it's a good place to do a lot of things, yes. um, and uh, the evidence is, is there in the incredible progress in the factory, yes. um, which was um, built with very very high quality in a very short period of time, um, and. Um, the, the the cars coming out of the of Shanghai right. are, are already very high quality. Oh, I can tell, and yeah. the the run rate it's is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I love yeah. that they use the uh, Chinese badge as well. It's like a symbol of pride, and sure. you know, made yeah. made in China. So it's yeah, it's cool. It's super cool. How did Tesla manage to get the first wholly owned foreign car company in China? Yeah, I mean a factory. Uh, well, uh, I've I've went to. China many times, and they kept saying that we would have to do this, you know, majority local owned venture, and, and I said that well, and we had to partner with someone. I said, well, oh, you know, we're a little late to the dance here, you know. So, who would we partner with, you know? Um, <laughs> there's nobody, nobody left, and and uh, and also we're just a little company, so you know, we're, you know, the, the, I kept saying we should get married, and we're like we're a bit young. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good example. <laughs> but yeah, you know, and, and then so then um, you know, but and and, I'll, and then also as I point out, like you know, there's so many Chinese companies that are going to you know they're establishing factories in or in the U.S. I mean, there's like Faraday Future and that kind of thing, and and. That's hundred percent owned by them, and so if, I mean, to be fair, it should be allowed that an American car company should be able to own its factory in China as well. Um, and so we, you know, talked to them for over a number of years, and they eventually said, "Okay, well, we'll, we'll change the law." So they changed the law, but now, now other other companies can do it as well. Um, so it's not just limited to Tesla. Hmm. And how much of that production hell, like learnings, have really enabled? Because one of the, I don't want like to bring up CapEx, but one of my favorite things is the stats in the shareholder letter. It's so much cheaper, not only faster, but it yeah. seems like the, you guys have learned so much from this, the Fremont factory, and that really enabled like kind of a turbocharged uh, build for Shanghai. Yeah, the, <clears throat> I, I think the, the big difference is, is like we are way less dumb than we were. <laughs> um, so the the foolishness of capital expenditures was very high, um, and it's less high now. <laughs> um, and, and then with the the Shanghai factory, we designed out all of or, or as much of the the foolishness as we could think of um, that exists at Fremont um, and at in Nevada. Um, so we just made, made a lot of decisions that weren't smart, and um, and we, we designed those out so that such the production line is much simpler. Um, so it's much simpler and and better implemented. Um, and then um, we also found like that the in most cases the suppliers were more efficient in China as well uh, than in the U.S. So um, but we, we've also managed to get a lot more output from existing equipment in, in the U.S. as well. So 
uh, the model three body line in in Fremont, for example, was only ever meant to do five thousand cars model threes a week, mm-hmm. and it's doing seven thousand. Wow! Nice. Wow! So, wow. Nice. And and it, with, with 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 turning off a bunch of unnecessary things that were being done. So, um, it it, I mean, there's just a, there was a lot of foolish things that we were doing. So, um. And, and we changed some of the designs and um, made it easier to. It would, it, you know, it's it, it's like a, hundreds of little things um, to make it to make it easier to build. And and so being able to get forty percent more output off the same line obviously makes a makes a big difference. Um, and and while while reducing the cost the, the marginal cost of production, and, and I and I think improving the quality of the car. Um, so it's it's all good good stuff. It was. The result of a ton of hard work by, um, by a lot of people. So, yeah, and, but we, we're, it was kind of nece- necessary in that we, we, there was we didn't really have a place to put a second Model Three uh, body line. So it's like either we either make this one go faster, or we will not be able to ex- um, achieve production. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Model Three body line in Shanghai is um, much much simpler than the one in. Uh, and I say that in a good way, um, then the, because it has the same the same end result. So if 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 you, if, you know, um, and and but but it, it's a, a much easier to understand. There's just getting rid of unnecessary movement. There's a, a lot of unnecessary movement in the Fremont body line, but not in Shanghai. Um, so you guys said in the production letter that you just started battery production in Shanghai too, and. I heard that you guys were uh, getting cells from cattle and LG Chem. Are the cells basically kind of like a commodity part that you can uh, assemble into your battery packs there? Or, you know, does it make a difference? How do you see that long term? I I believe these cells are not yet from LG. We we, we do expect to uh, use locally locally produced cells, but I'm... um, uh, like I don't. To be clear, I don't always know exactly what's going on in, everywhere <laughs> in the fifty thousand person company. So, so, some of the things, like the most 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 of the things I say, will be correct, but maybe occasionally something that's not. Um, as to this, my knowledge, we're not yet using um, uh, LG Chem cells. We're using Panasonic cells made in Nevada. But LG Chem can make pretty much the same cells as Panasonic. Yes, but pretty much is not the same as <laughs> same. So, there, there's still a few. Uh, bugs to work out with the LG Chem cells um, before we can use them in our module and battery pack uh, production system. Um, the CATL cells, or the CATL situation will be more of an integrated module than it will be a cell. Um, um, and that's so, so that it's, it's not just, it's, it's not super easy to replace these things. Mm. Um, Yeah, we're, we'll be. We do expect to use CATL. We do expect to use LG. Currently, we're use, using Panasonic. When I say expect to use, I mean like virtually a matter of months. So by the middle of this year, we probably ex- be using both LG and CATL um, in, in volume. Wow. So we were talking about a lot of Tesla stuff, but we kind of wanted to ask you about your personal history because we were saying yeah. you were saying how there's some misconceptions you would like to make straight and you know Ashley Vance wrote a book about you I just read oh, May's lovely sure. book and it was really wonderful I loved it and learned a little bit more history about your family and you but um, what are some of the misconceptions that you would like to correct you know most of this is just it ended up being kind of water under the bridge that people didn't notice that much mm. um, you know I mean there's a sort of so, some stories in there where it, it sounds like I like fired people all of a sudden and arbitrarily uh, which was not the case uh, there were um, you know, the, the, it just actually asked somebody who uh, who who didn't know what was going on, and then that person was suddenly not there, and they didn't know why. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I <laughs> you know, I, I definitely do not fire talented people, and you know, unless there's no option. So yeah. Um, and and so not 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 without warning or. I keep hearing you say we. Like it sounds like you're always thinking of everybody. You're, I, I see you as a very selfless person in your oh, endeavors. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, yeah. 
it's like from the age of 12, it sounds like you've been thinking about how to help humanity. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be sort of like some, you know, the sort of savior or something like that, you know, but it's, it's really just that, uh, if, if it just seems like the, it just, I don't know, seems like the obvious thing to do. I, I can't, like, I'm not sure why you do anything else. Um, You, you know, we, we want to maximize happiness of the population and propagate into the future as far as possible and understand the nature of reality. Um, and from that, I think everything else follows. Um, I saw you on Twitter, um, like talking about how, like people are having this rumor that you've been wealthy your whole life and that would be like the only reason you became successful and you've debunked that. and. Can you like share more about your upbringing and what led you to going to North America uh, when you sure. were Sure. Um, I was in, in South Africa and uh, it seemed like w w wherever there was, like a lot of the advanced technology in the world was being produced in America mm -hmm. um, and there's Silicon Valley especially. So I wanted to be where where I could sort of be have an impact on technology so that's or, or be involved in the creation of, of new technology. So that's what prompted me to go to um, at, at first Canada because I could get citizenship in Canada through my mom, and then ultimately to the U.S. Um, but yeah, I just uh, left South Africa um, um, when I was seventeen and landed in Montreal. I had like I don't know about two thousand dollars Canadian. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I started to study staying in a youth hostel for a few days, and then th there was this—you could buy a ticket to go across the, ca the country for a hundred bucks uh, and stop along the way. And so um, I did put that, and uh, just took a greyhound across Canada and saw all these like little towns. Well, we were getting. <laughs> I, I didn't have much. I had like a backpack and a, a suitcase of books. But the 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 that the bus company Greyhound they unloaded it uh, in one of the cities, and then the bus left without my my stuff. Oh, that's nice. So I literally had nothing. All your books. But your clothes too. Um, actually, weirdly, I think I might have had the books thing, but no, my, <laughs> my clothes. That was priorities. All you needed. Yeah, because I needed. I was just sitting in the bus station, reading, waiting for the bus to get ready. Yeah. Um, and I think I had the books, but not not. No, but no clothing. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so, anyway, um, but I managed to get to Swift Current, Saskatchewan, um, and then my my it's it's your cousin, cousin's son. Cousin's son, yeah, has a wheat farm there, and I worked on the wheat farm for about six weeks. Wow! Um, oh. And turned so I turned eighteen in Saskatchewan. Um, it's in this town called Swift Current. So that was summertime, right? It was June. Yeah, yeah, June twenty eighth. So, because I've been there in the winter and it's like minus forty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be traveling. There. Yeah. Did you ice skate? Did you try ice skating? No, there was it was quite warm. Okay. Oh, well, time. I mean, in the winter. Did you stay for the winter? Were you there in the winter? <laughs> no, I was just there, I was there for about six weeks. Oh, you're lucky. You survived. That's good. Yeah, so <laughs> it's I was cold there. Literally work, working on the wheat farm. Um, we did a barn raising and I cleared out the wheat bins. You know, the grain grain silos and that kind of thing. And um, I just worked the vegetable patch, basically just doing various things. Was your mind just thinking of what you're what you're gonna do after that? Yeah, I was trying to figure out what what I do next. Uh, don't know what to do. Um, so then, then I ended up getting back on the bus and went to Vancouver, mm. and I had a, a half uncle there um, who was kind of in the lumber industry. Mm -hmm. um, he like made lumber like lumber equipment. Sounds like the Northwest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically. So I ended up chainsawing logs and working on uh, the slumber mill um, and uh, cleaning out the, 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 the where, they, where they boil the pulp in these like mm. cra crazy sort of boiler rooms. Yeah. Um, wow. And that, that might be the hardest job I've had actually because you have to like crawl through this little tunnel um, in a hazmat suit and then uh, it, with the with, uh, uh, shovel with, with and, and then shovel this sort of steaming sand and and, and mulch out of the <laughs> the boilers to clean them out. 
Um, wow. And, and you have to like, there was only one entrance or exit, which was like a little, little tunnel. If you're claustrophobic, you could be real, real bad. And, and then you could you shovel the, the, the sand and the mulch through the tunnel uh, and it would actually block the tunnel. And then somebody else would reach in and shovel it out from the other side. So just big enough, long enough that if you have a shovel with a long handle, the, so, so one person on the inside can shovel it far enough that the, someone on the outside can shovel it out. Wow. And then yet to, to rotate every 15 minutes to avoid getting hypothermia. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and there's intense. no safeties to just a man looking out for you. <laughs> it was just two people kind of paired up. So if like one person collapses and you go to call somebody, <sighs> but it'd be really hard to drag somebody out. I have to say that it does not seem safe. Because if the tunnel gets blocked, trying to get the try and block that tunnel would be very difficult in a short period of time. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it was the highest paying job at the, the, at the employment office. So, <laughs> so, so that's why I was like, okay, the other jobs were like, I don't know, eight dollars an hour, and this one was eighteen dollars an hour. You need to buy your clothes, and they're all gone. <laughs> well, they gave they did give you a hazmat suit. So, oh, there you go. Yeah. How long did you have? To, did you do that job for? Uh, like four days. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was, it was, then it was done. Yeah, it was the, awesome. You said it was like a short term thing cleaning the grain bins, uh, cleaning the, the, yeah, the, boilers. the boiler rooms. Mm-hmm. So, what was next? We yeah. were in boiler rooms and then. Yeah, so it was basically. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, literally, it was like a lumberjack who's chainsawing uh, logs um, and uh, just doing lumbery, lumber stuff, basically, um, for a few months there. And then applied for college and I went to uh, Queen's University in um, Kingston um, and uh, was there for a couple of years and then uh, somebody that suggested I should apply to UPenn and uh, I I didn't think I'd be able to go because I, I, I paid, paid for my own way through university just which is actually not that hard in Canada because the, the tuition system yeah the tuition is highly subsidized in Canada so um, so with, you know, with basically some, if you, if you just sort of work during the, the summer and semester and take out some loans and some, get some scholarships, you can pretty much go to any college in Canada, I think. But I met someone who was, who was at UPenn and, who, and they said, you should at least apply. And I applied and they, they actually gave me like quite a big scholarship. So uh, that, that allowed me to go there. And so I did the physics and economics um, there. And, uh, and and then that that's what led to the road trip to Stanford with uh, Robin Wren. Um, and, uh, and and then I, that I was during that, that summer that I was, was like, okay, I, I can either spend several years kind of doing a PhD and not that I care about the PhD actually, but I just needed a lab. Um, but I, I could either spend a bunch of years working in a lab um, and maybe it would Maybe the technology would pan out, or maybe it wouldn't. Um, but the internet would w- was definitely about to go supernova in '95. So I was like, okay, look, I, I can always come back to working on electric cars, basically, um, and which I did. <laughs> um, but the internet is not going to wait. So was, uh, so then I put um, Sanford on deferment. And um, started up two, which was really just, uh, you know, we started off with maps and directions, yellow pages, white pages, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it was, you know, for, for best of my knowledge, the first maps and directions on the internet. So, uh, and there's still some like patents I have. Uh, well, I don't have many more, but I think they've obviously lapsed at this point. But. Um, for maps and directions and Yelp pages and advertising and stuff. And I, I wrote the whole the whole initial code base I wrote personally, because it was, there wasn't any rails, it was just me. So, um, and I only had a few thousand dollars and then my brother joined and he brought like $5,000, which was a lot. Yeah, at least for the first few months, there was literally only one computer. So the website, when the website wasn't working, it was because I was compiling code, <laughs> <laughs> and and, um, and even to get an internet connection was pretty hard. But there was an internet service provider on the floor below us. We were more or less squatted in this office. The landlord was was like out of the country or something, 
and nobody was using it. <laughs> so, so you lived in there? Yeah. I think I read that in May's book, you showered at the YMCA then, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's smart, though. I mean, you, you were thrifty. You did what you had to do. We just like had no no money, so <laughs> what are gonna do? Yeah. What did people think about Zip2 generally? Was it like seen as a crazy idea, or like did people even understand the internet back then? Most people did not understand the internet. Most people didn't know. But even on Sand Hill Road, like we tried pitching people to invest in an internet company. Most of the VCs we pitched to had never used the internet. Do you remember some of the VC what? firms you went to on Sand Hill? Um, I remember most of the time we wouldn't take a meeting, and if they did take the meeting, they were pretty bored and not uh, <laughs> d- said like, "Who's who's made money in the internet?" No, we're like, "No one." Okay. Um, but but the, the sea change occurred when um, Netscape went pro- public. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, but the first thing I, I tried to do was not to start a company. I tried to get a job at Netscape, but they didn't reply to me. Oh no. Oh. oh man. So I just and I tried and then I tried hanging out in the lobby at Netscape. <laughs> I don't know who to talk to. I was, I was really too shy to talk to anyone. I don't know. So it's like okay, I can't get a job at the only internet company that yeah. you know that, that that does internet software. So then I'll try writing software. Um so that's um kind of what what happened there. Yeah, and then my, like I said, my brother came down and joined. This is like all well, like late '95, um, and then in January '95, I think it was the um, uh, there was there was a lot more interest in the internet stuff following this, the Netscape IPO, um, and the the software software was more impressive, I guess. So then we then more da- more David Allen invested, um, so their VC firm on Sand Hill Road. Um, and they they invested, I think it was like $3 million for effectively 60% of the company. Wow. Um, which we thought was crazy. Uh, they're like, well, these give, they're going to give us the money for nothing? <laughs> 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 they must be mad. <laughs> Yeah, so they, that, that this this seemed like like crazy that they would give so much money for a company that consists at the time of about five people. Um, like literally, I think five people at the time. So, uh, but anyway, it, it worked out well for them in the end. So we we then we hired a lot more people. Um, we built out the service and. Uh, and they also end up writing a bunch of software to bring the newspapers online. So Knight Ritter, New York Times Company, Hearst, uh, all became investors and, and customers. Um, and at, at one point, Zip2 um, was responsible for a significant section of the New York Times Company website. Yeah, so I got to know the media industry pretty well. And... Uh, but but uh, over over what what really happened with with Zip2 is it effectively got too too much there was, there was too much control um, by the existing media companies um, so they had too many board seats and too too much voting control yeah. and that they kept uh, trying to push the company down directions that made no sense um, yeah, so um, like Zip2 actually had uh, really good software I'd say. Software that's comparable in some ways more advanced than say a Yahoo or Excite at the time, but it was just not being used properly, um, and it was all being forced through uh, through media companies um, who would they not not use it, you know. So it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, we've got the best technology, but it's it's not being deployed properly. So, but fortunately, uh, Compaq came along, and they um, Compaq Compaq had acquired digital equipment. And digital equipment had um, owned AltaVista, which at the time was mm-hmm. probably best search, the search, best search engine. Mm-hmm. So they thought that their idea was they will combine AltaVista with a bunch of other internet companies and try to compete, create a competitor to Yahoo um, or Excite. That, that was the Excite used to be a big thing, amazingly, <laughs> um, and Yahoo used to be a big thing. Yeah, 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 yeah a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now it's like owned by Verizon or something. Yeah. And there was AOL. AOL, AOL yeah. back then. Yahoo's a crazy story. They, you know, 
Yes. Almost, they failed to acquire Google twice. You know, Microsoft offered them like forty billion or something, and they turned it down. And then Alibaba saved them out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Alibaba stake was worth more than the whole, whole company at one point. by like a, yeah, a huge amount. Right. It was basically a proxy for Alibaba shares trading. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. But yeah. at, at one point, at, I mean, at that time, like if you go back to say ninety eight, ninety nine, Yahoo seemed like an unstoppable juggernaut. Yeah, yes. like literally, like yeah. this yeah. company will, you know, <laughs> is a behemoth. <laughs> Nobody could possibly defeat them. Um, but anyway, um, and, and where's Com back today? Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, but but that, that that was their idea, which is you know at least if executed well, could have made sense. Um, Kimbo, wow. <laughs> yeah. What are you what are you guys doing? We're recording a podcast. Um, yeah. How do you want me to join? Um, yeah. Pull up a chair. So what do you remember about Zip Two? Um, yeah, we remember. Yeah. So but uh, then the internet came along. We had this huge thing. I mean, it was always. It was always there, but it became a big deal. And then Elon was working on uh, working in Silicon Valley, and as I remember it, Elon overheard uh, a meeting where uh, some of the Yellow Pages companies were thinking of doing sort of online Yellow Pages. And no, where would I? Why would I have been in a meeting? I don't know. Like I, this, is, <laughs> this is a long time ago. But anyway, you you called me up and you said we should. Do, you think you can do, uh, do a better job? So we think we can do a better. Maybe job, you made so. that up to try and get Kimball interested. How would I be in a meeting with Yellow Pages Company? I have no idea. That's what I remember. <laughs> no. But what's your version of that? Sleepless nights. Where? We? I don't even know any Yellow Pages. Uh, I, I agree with you. Okay, I agree with okay. you now. <laughs> but but um, so it was like uh, I think uh, April of 1995. We started working on it, and the um, uh, uh, I guess the idea was fairly simple to take mapping and apply it to the internet and there were there were a few other companies trying to do it but no one with uh, uh ver the very cool technology of of uh sort of what was called vector-based mapping which is mm. which is what, what we all use today where the map is actually alive you know not not just a picture that was very ahead of its time you know uh, i think we were the first i i, I know mm. there were other p people putting maps on the internet but i think we were the first to put vector-based mapping which is what the kind of technology you use today on on the internet and door-to-door -door directions. So it was cool. I, I remember my brother and I pressing go on, on his server at our office and it took about 60 seconds for the first door-to-door door -to -door directions to wow. come up on wow. the screen. Wow. <laughs> and even oh 60 God. seconds was amazing. Yeah. You were oh, like, sure. this is incredible. Door-to-door <laughs> like, -door directions to anywhere. This is just amazing. And um, Definitely seemed amazing at the time. Definitely seemed amazing at the time. Yeah, yeah. it's like... Now it's like, so it's like, so now it's like wherever. normal, but um, this was like an impossible thing. <laughs> so cool. It was so cool. And uh, using Java, Elon had coded a, a, a interactive map, which again, all super normal stuff today, but the ability to just draw a square and zoom in or zoom out, that was just unheard of uh, mm -hmm. technology. <laughs> draw <a> square. <laughs> yeah, you remember that? It was like a little, little, little red square on the Java map. On a browser, it was that was unusual. Yeah. Yes, you just like yeah. Well, you cheated if you're using Java applets. Yeah, but this was when Java sucked and it was barely. Yeah, you know, this was like the, probably the most. It was I ninety-five. Think got, I think we even got some sort of recognition because it was the most advanced Java application on on Java at the time because hmm. it was so ridiculously hard. hard it was it was a really crappy technology at the time. Well, but this this was done on it. Oh, this wow. thing is that if if you if you downloaded the the Java app, we could we could uh, transmit the vector data, not just a bitmap. Mm -hmm. And this is what, when everyone was on a modem. Right. So if somebody's on like you know twenty eight kilobits modem, or for, you know trying to download an, a map image mm -hmm. would take forever. Whereas if you had but downloading the vector data so that locally rendered using the, the, the Java applet was super was relatively speaking super fast. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's what made it cool. Smart. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even like vector maps or even Google Maps was using like raster maps a few years ago. Like, it seems like very ahead of its time. Well, we we were the but first. I, I, I believe I believe we, the two of us were the first humans to see maps and digital directions on the internet, which, which I think is pretty cool. Very, cool. very cool. Yeah. How, Garmin came out. How, when did Garmin first launch? 
Um, well, they weren't internet based, right? So you could, you could. Actually, I don't think Garmin was even a player at this point. It was uh, it, Navtech was the only place that we were. That's where we got the data from. Yeah. And they were building it for for Hertz Neverlust, which came out a few years later. You know those yeah, yeah. things that no one uses in the the GPS <laughs> systems. Um, really, really bad technology, but the actual mapping data was amazing. And so we took that and uh, applied it to the internet. We were 22 and 23 at the time. It had cost them $300 million to build this data, and they gave it to us for free with a simple contract saying, if you ever make any money on this, you've got to, you've got to come Share it us. with them. Yeah. And wow. that's, that's how we got it. Wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, you can, so it's amazing what, you, what happens if you ask. Ask nicely. <laughs> and there's also part of it was these guys had been working so hard on the tech and no one had ever seen what they were doing. Yeah. Because it was not on the internet and it was not being used for, for Hertz. And so it was just, they were excited that someone would use the data and it would they, people could see what they'd been working on. So how did you get, guys get the engineering chops to pull this off? Because it sounds like you were so young, you didn't really have any help, and then you built this like cutting edge piece of technology. Did I you, mean, you know, teach yourselves or from I don't know what time, what age, but you published your first the, the like Blast Star game, right? Yeah, when he was twelve. Did you write any other cool stuff back then? Other yeah, I wrote a bunch of games. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and then like occasionally like software for people that ask for software. You know, you also work for a video game company. Yeah, or, or, or funny, it was called um, Rocket Science. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we took a SpaceX tour yesterday. It was insane. Was, Thank you for that. That was amazing. Oh yeah, it was so good. It's like Batman's lair in there. <laughs> that's right. It's really cool. It really is amazing. But it gives you perspective on what Tesla's doing because the technology is so advanced, and the, there's you know interchange of information there, like the. I know they used the Inconel fuse, right? It was from SpaceX when they couldn't get the the power output, right? It kept burning up the fuse in the in the, the performance models. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool to see the SpaceX tech being applied to Tesla. I think I think there's yeah. a joint there's one joint employee between SpaceX and Tesla, and it's, really? it's the materials. Is it the materials engineer? What about Elon? Uh, I'm yeah. of Elon. <laughs> in addition to Elon. <laughs> Because there's just not that many humans on the planet that know how to do this stuff. No. Well, it sounded like back in the old days, it was was it just Elon doing the coding, or I mean, I did a little for like HTML front you end, still but it wasn't Elon? mine. Uh, not recently, uh, but no, there was there was we had no money, so you can employ him. <laughs> yeah. So I just wrote, I just wrote all the software. And you worked through the night, right? You, you just never. Yeah, according yeah. to May's book, you worked. just never slept. I don't. <laughs> I mean, we we lived in a little office. I think this address was 470 Sherman Way in. Uh, yeah. In Palo Alto, it was probably. It was about the size of this room here. Yeah, it was probably like 15 feet wide by 30 feet long, with a little little closet in the back. And we would um, we, we we couldn't afford a place to sleep, or like a like a house, a home or apartment. So we would sleep in it, and it had a couch that was a futon, and we would pull out the futon, take turns sleeping on the futon or the floor. Although he coded a lot at wow. night, so I usually got the futon at night. <laughs> um, uh, and we had, we had to code it at night because the server, when the internet was live, needed to be functional. And we just had data for the Bay Area at the time. So we were just kind of making sure that the people in the Bay Area could use it. And then, um, uh, and then we had a little, little mini fridge with a cooking stove on it. And we'd cook uh, simple things, you know, like pasta sauce and pasta and things like that. That would be as cheap as dirt. People think you, it's expensive to eat real food. It's actually really cheap. Yeah. You know, you cook, cook some vegetables, pasta, and beans and stuff. Beans, super cheap. So we had that Jack <laughs> in the Box. Absolutely the cheapest. And then, and then we would go eat at Jack in the Box, which I can still, I still kind of shiver a little. <laughs> and I still, I haven't eaten there for, for probably 20 years uh, or longer, maybe 22 years. And I can still probably recite the entire menu. Yeah, we cycle through the menu at Jack in the Box because it's walking, it was like a few blocks away from. And it was open 24 hours. Open 24 hours. Uh, trying to get, uh, you know, dinner at Palo Alto after 10 is a very difficult. Zero. Yeah. 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 So did they know you very well at, at Jack in the Box? Well, they didn't really. No. They did? <laughs> no. And I remember one time I got a milkshake and, and I, I was so tired. It was like four, four in the morning and just needed to get some sugar for the, for the rest of the night. And, and there was something in it. 
Oh no! And I remember just flicking it out and just pretending it didn't exist, and just <laughs> kept drinking my milkshake. Oh, <laughs> oh that's horrible. it was. It was like that. Or that kind of like not in the zone to go back into Jack in the Box and argue about a milkshake. But I don't want to not drink the milkshake. And part of the reason that food was like so cheap is that they had. Uh, some people, I think, died of food poisoning. Yes, of course. Uh, yes. At, like, it was it, right around that time when they got into a food poisoning scare. Oh, and the, <laughs> yeah, so the, the, it was just very cheap to eat there. <laughs> and I figured, like, you know, they probably have, you know, have taken some action because after the food poisoning. Yeah, so <laughs> hopefully, yeah, that's it's just like. But I still eat a little bit of it. Does it taste funny? <laughs> Stop eating if it tastes funny. <laughs> you run out of things to eat because it, after like the seventeenth chicken fajita pita, you're like mm. chicken fajita pita. Can't do it. The teriyaki bowl. Yeah, remember that teriyaki bowl? Was that one good? It's, not, it's actually it varied, but it was it was edible. It was so bad. Which one? One? The teriyaki bowl. Teriyaki bowl wasn't bad. There was the sort of uh, sourdough uh, grilled. Grilled cheese thing that was wasn't bad. Yeah, I honestly didn't mind it. That really. but yeah. Those were the good old days, right? I mean, it was honestly it was good days. I mean, we just we were just hoping that people would let us stay in the country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't really that worried about what we were eating. We, we were we were just doing everything we could to uh, to get to, to get someone to support the company. We didn't really understand. I didn't understand the venture capital all that much. So we were doing a seed round, an angel round, and doing our best to talk to everyone and anyone we could find. Uh, we had a very good friend with us, Greg Curry, who now passed away, who was older than us by about 10 years, I think. And yeah. uh, was a wonderful mentor, helped us out and uh, put a little money in as well. And and then uh, I did a lot of the work to just find, just network with people. I think our, uh, with our first salesman who was selling Yellow Pages ads for us, I uh, was a real estate agent who knew another person who knew this other person who helped us who helped us you know, raise or put together we ended up not doing the round but put together a, a round of like two hundred thousand dollars or something yeah and then um we did like part of it or something I don't yeah know. but i think once we had the java java map which was really quite impressive i mean if you've never seen if you're never you've never seen google maps or yahoo maps before it really is a remarkable thing to see we we started to go to uh we got it we got some audiences with some venture capitalists and it just went from we were starving we had no car well the car we had had broken the wheel and, fell off huh the wheel oh, fell off yeah. the wheel fell off yeah what kind of car was it i remember that it's an old bmw 3 series was it the one you went we did a road nice. yeah. across oh, the country yeah my, my, the one that my mom has some pictures of i think there's i think there's still a, a there's a there's a carve in the t in the road at page mill and El Camino. It literally the wheel came off the wheel fell off and and the, and the guy literally in the intersection just drove it without the wheel to the to the side yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty much time for the junkyard at that point because it, the whole car is just falling apart so uh, yeah it's like the point at which the wheel falls off it's time to go to the junkyard <laughs> No, that was no, that was way more stress. That was way later because <laughs> we already had the deal, but we were I we were not. I don't know if you were, but I was not legally in America, so I was illegally there. Oh, 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 I was legally oh, there, but but I was meant to be doing student work. Oh yeah, oh. I, I just I had a student work visa. Yeah, you you were, you were doing a P, you were supposed to be doing a PhD in Stanford and yeah. decided not to. So and I so wow. it was like I was allowed to do work, sort of supporting yeah. whatever you know. Yeah. I don't know. Whereas I, actually, I, I I try to get a visa, but there's just there's just not no, no visa you can get to do a startup. Yeah, fortunately nobody was paying you anything either. <laughs> and so so we ended up getting we got a deal from uh, from from Moore David out and uh, this uh, really high, well respected VC firm, and we had to break the news to them that 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 we take the bus we took the bus to get to to the offices we don't have. A car, and we don't have an apartment, and we're illegal. No, 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 no you're illegal. Uh, <laughs> I was legal. And, and so but I, I was legal, but my visa was going to run out in two years. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I was definitely student visa. I was, I, we needed to get it sorted, and so uh, they were great. I mean, the, the the lead investor, his wife was from Canada. They they knew the whole challenge of being an immigrant, and we had Canadian passports, and so. Uh, they they funded the company and they gave us 
some money to each buy a car and they gave us a salary so we could rent an apartment and they had a, we I got a, a visa uh, through through the company but but the, the day the morning we were supposed to present to the partners I went to Toronto to, because my mother was freaking out because she needed her computer fixed and I, what really <laughs> seriously this is brutal so I I, I flew out there planning to fly back on Sunday and the meeting was on Monday and I get to the airport on Sunday and um, the the, the border control, are, they, they call me out. They're like, you're, you're, you're going down to work. You're not going down for, for, for travel. And I was like, no, 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 I'm going down to work. I explained. Uh, actually, no, I didn't. I, I, I said, I, I'm not going to work because I think that's what I was supposed to say. But the lawyers told me not to say anything. And so they, they rejected me from the border. Oh. oh. And so I'm supposed to we'll do the presentation with Elon the next morning. And so a friend of mine came to pick me up at the airport and drove me across the border and we went to the, the the Buffalo border and just said we're going to go see the David Letterman show. Nice. Oh, that's hilarious. And the border control guy was like, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I got, I got, on, I got on, the, on the late night flight from Buffalo to San Francisco and uh, we made the meeting in the morning. So. Wow. Very good. Yeah. I mean, technically you were not going out of work because that would have required, meant you were being paid yeah, something. You know, you were, yeah, I wasn't actually paid anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Technically we weren't actually, no, you're right. You're not actually breaking the law. We're not breaking the law because we, we were not being paid anything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I should have told them that at the border control. <laughs> But anyway, it was very By frustrating. Work, do you mean getting paid for something? No, I'm not doing that. No, yeah, you're right. Exactly, we were not not being paid. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so then uh, they they approved the deal that Monday, and we started building Zip Two. You know, and um, it wasn't a business model for you know back in those days. Well, it was it was kind of like a pre like Yelp is like is but the business model was similar to sort of Yelp, yeah. but it was at a time when most businesses didn't didn't know what the internet was, so mm. and most people didn't have an email address or yeah, they we went to online. Yeah, explain so. to them what a website was. The internet was the, kind of this cool thing. People were using Netscape browser. <laughs> and uh, I think by the end of it, we, we got 18,000 businesses to be on, on our service, pay, paying to be like w with websites and everything. Yeah. You know, a lot of the things that you can do today, like automatically build websites, we, we, we built a lot of those sort of tools to make it easier to build websites. And we had to sell door-to-door -door uh, because that was the only way. Did you uh, hire people or is it just you guys going Nordic? No, no, we had a team by that time because we could hire, hire a team. Yeah. But um, I remember talking to a Yellow Pages guy once and it was amazing. It was the head of the oh, yeah. Toronto Star that they owned it's all like, the Yellow Pages. In the Yellow Pages will never die. Famous last <laughs> word. <He> literally. Because <laughs> we, we went and talked to a partner. We said, we want to part with you and, and let's, let's be one of your partners to, do, to put the Yellow Pages online. And he picked up the Yellow Pages, this book, this big, thick book that's full of ads, this multi-billion dollar <laughs> revenue stream. I mean, these, these guys were so arrogant and so, so arrogant. like, oh, we are the kings of the world and Seriously. it will never end. He picked, he picked up this book and he like, threw it at me. So and he said, do you ever think you're going to replace this? <laughs> <laughs> and I was just literally like, I, I, I mean, my head and my head is like, Dude, you're already dead. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Reminds me of the anti-Tesla people, you know. Yeah. Gas cars will never die. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's yeah. Awesome. But I mean, like, if we, we saw the growth of the internet. We saw the use of the yellow pages. We saw even all our competitors and stuff. And no one was using the paper yellow pages if you had the choice. Yeah. Yes, exactly. No one. Yes, that's very true. And so, so at that point, very few people were on the internet. So it was really a question of really, is the internet going to succeed, mm -hmm. which we were huge believers in. And these guys were not, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't even clue in. Yeah, but it was like one, one foreign country after, after another. Mm -hmm. We'd say like, listen, we'll just put your L pages online. It's going to cost very little. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll still own all the content and everything. Um, and they're like, they'll just throw us, throw us out of the office. Yeah. You're like, no, and how dare you even suggest this? It was, it was, it was extraordinary, and it's been interesting. And we're like, okay, I guess we'll just build it. And, yeah. And then if we're, yeah. But it's been interesting to watch over the years where, like in PayPal, the competitors were, were not uh, banks, you know, even though that should have been the competitor. No, there, there, were, there were banks that tried to compete. Um, but wasn't it eBay mostly that was sort of the, the bank? Uh, well, eBay, eBay had something called Bullpoint. Bull um, yeah, that which, but it wasn't exactly like PayPal. Yeah, um, but 
yeah, generally eBay had an issue with trying to uh, get payment for stuff. Like, yeah. more, like two people would have to mail checks to each other. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's going to work. <laughs> if you mail a check and you receive the check, and you, like, how do you know the check's real? Then you've got to, you know, cash check and take, you know, two to five days for the, for the money to transfer. So it could take two weeks before somebody had confirmed payment, and then, I, and then they would ship you the item. And so the, the transaction uh, velocity was very low as a result. Mm-hmm. If you had instant payment, you could imp- improve transaction velocity dramatically, like a factor of you know, maybe three to five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But so, I've, I've just sort of seen that the, 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 when, you, when an in- industry is disrupted, the, you worry about the major players. I mean, we remember we, when we started Tesla, we were aspiring to be the GM of the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Four years later, GM went bankrupt. <laughs> You're like, oh, okay, we don't need to be. We don't need to. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Um, and uh, and and it's you know whoever is going to be the main competitors, you know, we don't know yet. But um, uh, it may not be the the entrenched players. It may, it may be not, yeah. uh, sort of yeah. other companies. Um, and so so that happened at Zip Two, where where we, we we tried our best to partner with the industry because that seemed like the best way to make some money and actually have a revenue model. And we ended up finding the newspapers to be a, a better partner because they didn't have the Yellow Pages business. Mm-hmm. And um, they, I think they seemed, were smarter. Their, their classifieds business was, was getting eaten away by Craigslist. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before Craigslist, classifieds was the bread and butter of, of the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And of course, anyone who used, used Craigslist would never use the newspaper. So it was, it was those folks seemed to have a better, uh, uh, at least some of the players had a more, more vision of the future. And so our business became putting you know, major newspapers, New York Times, to all of the you know Philadelphia Inquirer, or Chicago Tribune, or whatever, all, all the main players, all the, the the LA Times, everyone. And then we started going internationally, doing the same thing. So if you went on to the New York Times website and you wanted to search for a restaurant, of course they have all these reviews. Or if you wanted to search for a home, then you could you could we tied the MLS together with maps and door to door directions. So all, all of these. Services that we now use and take for granted that use maps in the directions we we did that all in the '90s to find a business model. Wow. Yeah. Well, why didn't you do PayPal um, after Zip2? Why didn't you go like straight into sustainable energy? Um, right. So, um, got to re- recall things that are now <laughs> quite a while. So it would have been like '98. Um, when Compaq offered to acquire Zip2, um, and uh, which I think it was a good thing to, for them to acquire it because, as I mentioned, it, the the newspapers actually, or the media companies, had too much control over Zip2. So they were not, we, we had great technology that was not being deployed effectively. Um, and they would just generally be averse to anything that could remotely be competitive with their newspapers. So... So we're sort of trapped in this uh, situation, um, and uh, the thing Compact came along and, and, and bought the company in late '98, and the deal closed early '99. So, so then as a result of that, um, Kim and I had some capital, uh, you know, twenty million dollars or something out of it, and um, the, the the I think the thing that, that was frustrating to me was that we built uh, incredible technology. Um, and it had not been used. It was just sort of like, it was very disappointing. You know, we put a lot of work into this technology and it just wasn't being used. So I was like, okay, I want to do one more thing on the internet just to show that we can make technology that is, uh, is when it's used properly, can be extremely effective. So I thought about what, what, what's digital, essentially? What's, what's it, what's, what exists in the form of information um, and is also not high bandwidth because um, in 99 people still mostly had modems so you couldn't like video was not really feasible in 99 so but money is low bandwidth and digital effectively mostly digital so it's like what can we do to make money work better um, and, and like money in my view is, is essentially an information system for labor allocation um, so it has no power in and of itself. It's a, it's like a database for, um, this, for guiding people what, what, as, as to what they should do. 
Um, and so you can think of banks as a set of heterogeneous databases with um, that they're actually not very secure. Uh, and certainly the uh, the monetary system, the transfer system of checks is not is, is very insecure. Still is insecure. So are credit cards. Um, and, um, and and it's all it's still mostly batch processing. And it was in, entirely batch processing that day. So it was not. So payments were money was this like heterogeneous uh, high latency low security uh, collection of databases that's what banks are um, and so f just from an information theory standpoint this should be something that can be much better if it can be real time uh, secure and, um, and f you know just very fast um, and essentially it's just one real-time database um, so it's like okay let's try to build that um, so that that that's what x.com was and then at, at the time I also thought we, what we should try to do is just do all the financial things as well not just um, payments I, I still think that's really what PayPal should have done but whatever it's water under the bridge at this point um, and then there was a company that was formed around the same time called Confinity, which was Peter Thiel, Max Levchin, and, and Luke Nosek, David Sachs, Ken Howard, and a number of those. And um, at X.com, there was also like Jeremy Stoffelman, and uh, who created Yelp, um, Roloff Boza, who then went on to run Sequoia and, and fund YouTube. That was at, was at X.com. So we just had this like, Two, two, two companies with like a crazy amount of talent, uh, X.com and Confinity. And Con Confinity started as a Palm Pilot cryptography company um, b back when you you could you communicate via the infrared port of a Palm Pilot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 I have one Palm Pilot. So it was like, um, so you there, you could, you could basically communicate crypto tokens between Palm Pilots using the infrared port and then reconcile them on a PC. On, on a PC. Now, obviously, that's, they, they evolved to go on the, in the payments direction as well. Um, and we were both in Palo Alto, like literally a block away from each other. Um, I think at one point we were briefly even in the same building. <laughs> it was, you know, you know. Um, so, so we were just competing with each other like maniacs. Um, and, and and then we had uh, our coffee on University Avenue, um, and said, "Hey, why don't we just combine our efforts, or we're just going to bludgeon each other to death here?" <laughs> um, so we, we merged Confinity and X.com, um, and raised a hundred million dollars in the space of three weeks in March of. 2000. Wow. wow. Yeah. Amazing. And in April, the market went into free fall. Yeah. Oh. So. The 2000. Yeah. And I was like. I remember that. So. That was insane. I know. And we kind of thought it was going to go into free fall, but we're like, we better get this thing done fast. <laughs> <laughs> or we're, we're both going to die. So. And, and so. so uh, X.com was technically the acquirer of Confinity, but it was a, you know, 50.1 on. 49.9 or something like that um, and um, and then there was a lot of drama there, there was so much drama at, at, at X.com um, and the, the company was called X.com for about a year and then we changed the company name to the product name the product, the product was PayPal um, but, but all the, the incorporation documents and everything is all this my incorporation documents who came up with the PayPal name? I actually don't know. <laughs> People call you guys the PayPal Mafia now, you know. <laughs> Teal, Teal wrote that in his book. <laughs> you know, I don't know who did the, 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 the PayPal. I was never a huge fan of PayPal as a name. Um, the, 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 the reason being that I, that I thought it made sense for, for the company to kind of... Um, broader? Be, be much broader. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, if, if, if you limit yourself to payments, then necessarily people want to transfer money out of the system. Um, and as, as soon as they tra transfer money out of the system, the efficiency of the database drops dramatically. 
because now you're in the traditional banking world. So if you just offer all the things that, if you, if you just basically address all the reasons why people are taking money out of the PayPal system, so you have to provide them with, with checks so that you have a bridge to the legacy transaction system, you got to provide them, provide them with a debit card, provide them with the ability to um, get a loan and that kind of thing. Um, and and, and um, But these are all ancillary to accelerating the, the velocity and accuracy um, and security of payments. Then, then if I, if basically, PayPal would be where all the money is. Mm-hmm. It would just suck all the money out of the banks, and there wouldn't be the banks would go away. Yeah. So, any plan you're going to do with the the X dot com? I wrote the, the, if they just execute the business plan. You know, the product plan I wrote in July two thousand. Well, let's just do that. But they, I talked to them several times, but they didn't do it. So why did you and PayPal kind of part ways? What was really the drama that led to that, you know, separation ultimately? Well, things were very dicey in 2000. Yeah. You know, companies were dying like all over the place. So I was CEO of, of the combined company. Um, and we're, we're doing quite well from a growth standpoint. Um, we were like you know, adding 100,000 users a month type of thing, which back then was a lot. Yeah. Um, but uh, financially, things were, were tough, and we needed to raise a financing round. We were also like, we, there were some technical questions around what what code architecture would we go with. And then there was also a branding question. Like I said, like I think we, we should not use PayPal as brand because this is not consistent with being where all the money is. Um, it, you, 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 you want a centralized database. You, you, so, so I was kind of against the PayPal branding, and... And I, and I wanted basically I wanted to do a bunch of things that that seemed extremely risky, and I I'm, I think those things would have would have worked out, uh, but at a time when companies are dropping like flies, um, and I'm proposing it, that, you know, that we do all these things that sound very risky, uh, this is for, this is just much too scary for the rest of the team. You seem to be attracted to crazy ideas that other people are like. That, like, you know, I think the autopilot one is a great example where everyone's kind of trying the spatial approach to self-driving. You know, they're doing Waymo for 10 years, nobody cares. And you come out and say, hey, we think vision is the way forward and deep learning and vision, you know, uh, will take us all the way there. How do you find, like, yeah, of course. the courage inside to, I mean, people have to be coming up to you all the time mm-hmm. and, you know, thinking that you're an idiot or it's never going to happen. and you know, how do you find that in yourself to like go through all that uh, resistance and still be confident in you know your thesis? I mean, I try to be hyper rational, so it's not you know to, it's just like if this is if the reasoning fits and you're not violating laws of physics or something, then that's the thing you should do. So, um, and, I, and I guess the other day. <coughs> I, you know, if if we lost all the money, I wouldn't. You know, as long as we didn't lose other people's money, I guess I just lost lose my money out of mind. Um, I, these things just don't seem that crazy to me. So, like I think if if like if PayPal had executed the plan that I wanted to execute on, I think it would probably be the most valuable company in the world. Yeah. Um, it would be called X, but it would be the most valuable company in the world. Um, on the other hand, now that's not all good though. On the other hand, then a lot of t- super talented people would have stayed, mm-hmm. um, and because because people got got acquired by eBay yeah. um, not long after, like you know, um, so there was like the PayPal coup at the end of two thousand. Eighteen months later, it was acquired by eBay. So, um, and and then. But, you know, if you think of the companies that came out of PayPal, the so-called PayPal mafia, YouTube, mm-hmm. you know, those st- Steve and Chad created YouTube, uh, Jerry Solomon created Yelp, um, uh, you know, Peter created uh, Palantir and a bunch of other things. Um, um, there's David Sachs created uh, this company, and uh, Reid Hoffman. Yeah. Created LinkedIn. Wow. 
it's almost like all that market cap still exists, but now it's allocated on all these other tech companies instead of yeah. X.com. <laughs> yeah. So in retrospect, it like, I don't know, sometimes like it's maybe a good thing that, uh, X wasn't, or PayPal wasn't, didn't achieve those things because all these other companies would have at least been delayed um, or may not have existed. There's definitely been kind of a resurgence in interest as we get into kind of cryptographic, you know, money and Bitcoin and all that of like yeah. interest in this idea, you know. And it's interesting, like, software hasn't eaten the banking industry yet. Software's eaten a lot of industries, there's some that it just hasn't, and banking's still there. You know. Stripes, Stripes eating them slowly, but they're doing, they're doing a pretty good job. They're, 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 the, the banks are in trouble if, if it's not Stripe, it's be somebody else. And you love code, but you don't seem to be as bullish on Bitcoin. Do you have any, could you break down like why? Because you're talking about this big database that's more secure for faster transactions. It seems like Bitcoin's hitting at least some of those. I, I'm neither here nor there on Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you think when you read like Satoshi's white paper for the first time? Were you like, oh, it's pretty interesting. Or that was pretty clever. It's it, it's it's just like the th things. Yeah. <laughs> this, this always gets like the crypto people angry, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there are, there are, there are transactions that are. Um, not within the bounds of the law, mm -hmm. um, and those, and there are obviously many laws in different countries, um, and normally cash is used for these transactions, um, but but ca but in order for illegal transactions to occur, those the cash must also be used for legal transactions. You need an, uh, an illegal to legal bridge. Um, that's where crypto comes in. So is it kind of the dark net stuff? It, it, it can't be entirely dark because otherwise, how do you buy normal stuff? It, and, and cash these days is used just much rarer. It's, it's hard. It's like increasingly difficult to use cash. Some places you can't use cash at all. Yeah. So there's a, there's a forcing function for uh, transactions that are illegal quasi legal and in some cases legal but it's they've got to have some it's got to be both legal and illegal it doesn't count otherwise otherwise you simply it, it can't just be transactions within uh, an illegal economy because how do you buy like you know food in a house or something you know something, you got you must have a legal to illegal bridge um, so where I see crypto as is effectively as a replacement for cash but not as a replacement for as a primary uh, not, not as I do not see crypto being the primary database. So now this is this is sometimes taken being like I'm being judgmental about crypto, and it's actually I think there's a lot of things that are illegal that shouldn't be illegal. Um, mm -hmm. um, but you know, so it's not as though I think that sometimes governments just have too many laws about that they should they should they shouldn't have so many things that are illegal. Didn't you say like on Mars there'd be less laws? Hopefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you still propose a direct democracy on Mars? Uh, I think probably that's the best that, I mean, probably it's the best thing. Mars technocracy. <laughs> the Mars technocracy. <laughs> yes. And you want to make laws super short and simple, right? Well, yeah, I mean, like, if people can't understand laws, then how do you, then what's usually going to happen is some special interest is going to bamboozle the public. With long laws, yep. And then the, the law is like reading this law. This law is like the size of Lord of the Rings, but a very boring version of it. <laughs> <laughs> like the dealership thing is just crazy to me. You know, like America is supposed to be a competitive, free market. It's weird, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, anyway, just so you want to keep the laws short and give them some kind of sunset period, so they don't just stay there forever. Otherwise, just accumulate over time, and just eventually it'll be unwieldy. So the laws should have some time frame associated with them. Mm -hmm. They automatically go away. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's just keep a little short to avoid trick trickery and, and sort of special interests uh, that ultimately does not benefit the public. Um, and, and then 
I think direct direct democracy is less susceptible to uh, corruption than a representative democracy. So, um, you know, corruption just being like, to what degree is this action being taken that do not serve the general the interests of the population? You know, um, do, do not result in a net increase in um, population happiness as a well. whole. Uh, so, that's 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 why I think probably direct is better. Um, and, and then you know, just have, have things in real time. So you know, if you, if you want to vote on something, you just you can vote on it real fast. You know? um, I'd probably make it. E I would say make it easier to get rid of laws than to put them in, um, because these things tend to have a lot of inertia, and so have a have a bias to, towards having laws go away and not be there well, you know so like maybe it, it takes 60 percent to put a law in place but 40 percent to remove it or something like that yeah i i, I, I mean, let's try it you know see what happens the bills are extremely long that they pass no one reads them <laughs> yeah the con hardly anyone in congress has read the bill and if even if they've read the bill if you quiz them on the details they would not <laughs> They'll find their page. Like, yeah, it was like, tell me what's, yeah, this, there was no idea. It seems kind of alarming that that's like the status quo and everyone just accepts it, but. Yeah, the, these laws tend to be written by industry groups as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that, they, they'll write the law and then, and then interact with the congressional staff and, and, and uh, but most of the work will be done by the industry groups. And so they're going to write laws that entrench the, their position. It's typically. like the, the or the players buying the ref, like you were saying yeah, earlier. Exactly. It's that exact thing. So you get the regulatory capture of the, exactly. The, 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 <laughs> yeah. The players shouldn't be paying the ref salary type of thing. Well, the ref shouldn't be thinking, I'm going to re retire and get paid by the players. <laughs> so... It's kind of amazing that it works as well as it does, given all these issues. Um, so, um, yeah, so then PayPal, I, I ended up getting malaria and <clears throat> anyway in 2001. Um, no, oh, two, yeah. Two, yeah, 2001. Yeah, 2001. Yeah, tell us about this, the malaria thing. Um, well, that was you went on vacation, right? Yeah, we went to South Africa with, with Kimball, actually. Yeah, it's crazy. And then came back and... I had like a near death case of malaria. Yeah, we lived, grew up in South Africa. We we'd go to the bush felt all the time, mm -hmm. to the what you guys call safari, mm -hmm. and you just you just had a house in the bush. So you you just go there every every few weeks or so. I don't think we ever took malaria tablets. We yeah. didn't have malaria in those days. I think there was a drought and then a flood and then suddenly there were mosquitoes. It yeah, was right. Like, yeah. and so we were we were told to. And we did take malaria tablets. You took, you yeah. took them as well. And um, and when he got back, the he was in Stanford, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Our uncle, who's a doctor in in South Africa, is like he has malaria. Wow. And they're like, no, no, he doesn't have malaria. We checked. So uh, check again. Malaria well, kind of the, hides the in the body. And they, that's why they wouldn't believe it. <laughs> so this was after PayPal got started. <clears throat> oh, this is two thousand one. <laughs> So it was sort of after the PayPal, PayPal coup. So I was I was on the PayPal board, and I was provide you know providing sort of product uh, advice and whatnot. But uh, in December, or late late December two thousand, went on a trip to South Africa, came back January early, early January two thousand one, and I had a severe case of malaria, almost died. Um, I sat next to his bed for about five days. Mm -hmm. Yellow. Oh just tubes going in and out of him, just that early morning till late at night, just waiting to see. And then they said to me, get some some uh, pajamas for him. And I, the closest store was some like Dress for Less or something. So I just got him some pajo uh, pajamas. And then, then the next thing, five, after five days, he woke up and he says, so there's bunnies on my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> I think was a bit uh, I think there were bunnies or... Or ducks or something because that was what I could get, and um, and I knew it was better. You were sleeping. I mean, like your it affected your brain that that harshly. Uh, yeah, no, it was bad. It was, yeah, it's really bad. Um, 
Did that change your perspective? How did it like influence you after that? I don't know. I, 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 I don't think it changed me that much, would you say? I don't think it changed you. No, I don't think it did. Um, yeah. But how many times have you been on vacation? I lost like 50 pounds though, it was great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, no more vacations so. <laughs> though. Well, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it took me like almost six months to get back to normal. Um, wow. so, uh, and then in, so in 2001, um, I was thinking about, you know, what to do next and, uh, and, um, I thought the, um, you know, this is like, okay, sustainable energy, like basically electric cars, solar, um, space. Uh, and then a friend of mine asked me, you know, so what are you gonna do next? I said, well, you know, that's, so I would love to do something in space, but I don't think anything, of, there's anything that a private individual could do in space, but um, at least I'm going to go on the NASA website and find out when people are going to Mars. And I go on the net web, NASA website and it's nowhere to be found. And I was like, well, this is pretty weird. Um, and then I discovered that it was actually a NASA policy not to talk about it. Um, really? Yeah, at the time. Huh. Why, why was that, do you think? Um, what I was told is that uh, when George Bush the uh, first was, um, he, when he was elected, he, he said in 90 he has not NASA to put together a plan to send people to Mars mm. in 90 days they came back with a plan and it was 500 billion dollars oh. um, and uh, it says well that this is like political suicide so he, then after that talk of manned missions to Mars were banned mm. um, that's what I sold yeah. mm. so the, anyway so it's like well you know Maybe there's something that can be done here to get the public excited about going to Mars. And if, if I get the public excited, then they will vote NASA to have more funding. Mm -hmm. And um, so the original idea for SpaceX was just to have a philanthropic mission to Mars. Yeah, actually, it started as a graphic of a, of a pot plant. You just need, just need to get the pot plant to Mars. You know, it was like an inspiration. Sure. Just, just to, as, a, as, a, as a way to prove to the world that it could be done. Uh, yeah, so the mission was called Mars Oasis. It was a uh, seasoned dehydrated nutrient gel that would hydrate upon landing. You get this great picture of green plants and a red background. Um, you like the first sort of life as we know it on Mars. And the you could also learn you know, a lot about what does it take to keep plants uh, alive and have a little miniature greenhouse on, on the surface of Mars. Um, so that's, that's what I initially pursued as, as like a way to basically increase NASA's budget. That was, it wasn't, let's create a space company. It was, how do we get NASA's budget increased so we can go send people to Mars? Um, and I, there was stuff, I was trying to figure out how to get this thing launched. And I, um, the, the rockets, the European and US rockets were too expensive and I couldn't afford, afford them. So, um, I went to Russia to try to buy some ICBMs, uh, in 2001, you know, literally, um, and, uh, they, they kept raising the price on me and it was quite, being quite difficult. Um, and I said, I, you know, I could afford to pay like, I don't know, $9 million for an ICBM but not, not 20, because I figured we need to do two of these missions because odds are good that one would fail and then it could have a, a negative impact potentially. Um, so that yeah, was pretty weird being in Moscow trying to buy ICBMs in 2001. <laughs> That's amazing. How do you yeah. negotiate to buy an ICBM? Yeah. Yeah, I call up the military and say, well, you know, they, they're going to <laughs> They got to get rid of these things anyway because of the arms reduction treaties. So it's like, if listen, if you're going to throw it away, I'll buy it off your hands. You know, <laughs> um, they have to. It was like SS-18 Denver. Um, uh, it was the biggest nuclear missile in the Russian fleet, and uh, but anyway, they're going to, you know, de decommission these things. So um, why why not just tell me them instead? Um, 
and, and then they, every, every time I talk to them, the price would go up, and I'm like, this is, this is not good. Because, you know, so even if once we do a deal, we're probably going to get shafted afterwards, too. And if <laughs> this is the pre-deal shafting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's what's going to be after, or it's, you know, when I've, after I've given the money, then it's not going to be good. So, uh, so that I, I, yeah. So, I, I, and then I started looking into it as, like, why rockets cost so much? And... And so there's nothing fundamental about why they should cost so much. If you add up the materials and say, if you, you know, it's not like the raw materials cost that much. You really just need to figure out a smart way to get the materials in that shape. Um, and, and then you need, we need to make rockets reusable. So like any form of transport, if it's not reusable, it's extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if cars were single use, um, you know, and you need a round trip, you, you know, if you bought a car for $20,000, then your round trip will cost you $40,000. <laughs> That's true. That's true. No, it's crazy. So, it's the same thing is true for aircraft and boats and rockets and everything. So, uh, so they were, the rockets were expensive even as expendable things, but then they were also not reusable. So, there's no way we're going to have a city on Mars unless we can have um, reusable low-cost, reliable rockets. That's fundamentally the issue. Uh, so, so I came to the conclusion that even if this Mars Oasis mission was successful, it would still not result in the goal. It, it would not materially further the goal of being a multi planet species because uh, the rocket technology was not good enough. Um, and it was not getting better. In fact, it was arguably getting worse. So. So the real thing that needed to be solved here is reusable rocketry and lowering the cost of access to space. And that that's, so I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna try to do that. Um, so then I got SpaceX started in early 2002, basically. Um, I, was, I was living in Palo Alto at the time, but most of the engineering expertise was in Southern California. So that's why I moved to LA. Um, Did you ever have any, like, even inkling of imagination that you could be doing, you know, a dozen launches a year and being contracted with NASA? <laughs> Is that even like it? I thought that was where I know I thought we had, you know, 10% chance of success or something like that. You ended up being chief engineer, right? Yeah. Because, like, no one wanted to give up their secure jobs of ULI and something but, at the yeah. beginning. I, exactly. I, uh, I actually tried to hire, but it, it basically, there had been a number of attempts at doing a sort of a private rocket company or commercial rocket company, and they're all, all really they all failed effectively, um, and then that's to to the degree that it was like a joke in the aerospace industry, like how do you make a large portion a large yeah, fortune right. in the rocket, you know, if it start with the yeah, how, how do you make how do you make a small fortune in in the rock industry? Start with a large one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm it's going to be small. From business. <laughs> yeah, they, they told me that joke so many times. I would just jump to the punchline, you know. <laughs> uh, so the yeah, it's, it was very hard to recruit people because uh, I had not built any physical hardware before. Um, so it's, and, and I kept being called internet guy. <laughs> <laughs> for the longest time, for ages. Uh, finally, so I made, for the first 10 years, they were calling me internet guy. Or basically, an internet entrepreneur yeah. slash fool. <laughs> 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 He's trying to start a rocket company. What if an idiot? That was generally how it, how it went. So it was quite hard to recruit people. And, you know, especially if somebody's got like a secure job at, you know, Boeing or Lockheed or something like that. Um, then trying to recruit them to be, you know, chief engineer of a sort of rocket company was hopeless. They'll, so basically, no, no, nobody, nobody who was who was good was willing to join, and there was no point in hiring somebody who wasn't good. So, uh, ended up being chief engineer. Um, you know, which is, yeah. So, sort of, the, the the first three launches failed, and probably if I'd been better, then I, we would have. Got into orbit sooner, so 
uh, it took me a while to learn all these things. So from books or books and talking to people. Did you go to Utah and talk to anybody like at ATK Orbital? Oh yeah, I visited ATK. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Orbital is, is uh, Dallas, right Virginia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I visited ATK, uh, visited Orbital. Um, and they, Orbital had had a success with the solid rocket uh, based Pegasus, mm-hmm. um, but, but they'd also gotten like an eight launch deal from DARPA. Uh, so you know, like, okay, if you got if you're starting off with basically an eight launch deal from DARPA, that's a, a good situation. And we did not have a launch deal from anyone. Um, and Pegasus is a, and I mean, there's some clever engineering with Pegasus, but it, Fundamentally, I think launching rockets from planes is not sensible. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds like it would be a good idea, but it's not. Um, and then e- even Orbital went away from doing that with their, as soon as you get past certain size, they went to ground launch. Yeah, I was reading somewhere that um, ATK, well, Thaikal, Morton Thaikal, they, they were doing snow cats, they were doing ski lifts, and they sold that to the man who made the DeLorean. He, really? Yeah. I just read that in their Wikipedia. I'm like, oh, that's fascinating. What to come around? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, so we got SpaceX going. Um, and that was very difficult. Um, we got the Falcon 1 rocket built. Uh, it was very simple. It's the simplest orbital rocket that's li- uh, liquid fueled, so that it had the potential for reusability, um, for for useful reusability. Um, and then yeah, we had three failures. Um, finally, got to orbit at the end of two thousand eight. So that was incredible. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Going down to Kwajalein and watching. Yeah, you wrote it like a blog for a while. Yeah, I actually still have it up there. It's uh, it's a little, and it's a, it's an old old blogging platform that Google still keeps alive. It's called quajrockets.blogspot.com. I think it's going to get a lot of traffic soon. <laughs> yeah, totally. Send it. Check it out. It's all there. It's uh, yeah. photos and photos of of uh, there was one photo of, of Elon picking up a, a, a satellite. He, we launched the rocket and the rocket exploded. It was very, very, very sad. Everyone's super sad. The people were like pouring their heart and soul into the rocket. And the satellite was, I think, a, a U.S. Uh, Navy or uh, uh, Air Force Academy. Air Force Academy, and it yeah. it was thrown out of the rocket and fell through the roof of the hangar. On the well, well, not now. It, this is like we really think it's really a hangar. The, exactly. It's like a like a like a stand up tent. And small tool shed. Yeah. Wasn't supposed to do that. Like the size, <laughs> maybe the size of this room. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the rocket it had. This is the first launch failure. So the uh, it, it had a there's a cracked aluminum B nut on that that cracked during during liftoff and created so the engine there was an engine fire. The this this wouldn't have been the end of the world, but there was a um, one of the the helium lines was a steel mesh overwrapped with like with a Kevlar sleeve, uh, and it melted the the, the sleeve the the, the um, in, and so we lost pressure, uh, pneumatic pressure, which caused the engine valves to close. So uh, about 30 seconds after liftoff, the engine shut itself off due to the engine fire. And then it, it, went, it went ballistic and, and, and basically smashed um, in, in the rocks just a, a couple, couple hundred feet offshore. Um, and when it when it's when, it was quite a big explosion actually <laughs> um it, it, in that explosion the satellite uh which was in a fairing went through the fairing on a ballistic arc back onto the island s- smashed through the tool shed roof and onto the floor in a pretty reasonable condition <laughs> like it wasn't totally gnarled um <laughs> Reuse it? So we, we, we gave them back their satellite. <laughs> so, so like, we didn't lose your satellite, but it may need some repair. But it was so improbable that the satellite would come back. 
Um, <laughs> we had a couple more failures after that. Um, yeah, 2008 was a particularly difficult year because we had the third failure um, in 2008. The Tesla round, financing round collapsed. Oh, such a nightmare. And I got divorced and it was just I think 2008 was bad year. <laughs> really, <laughs> really bad. Yes. Bad year. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anyone could. I, th I think 2018. I think 2018 was worse. What's up with eight? Well, with the Model 3 ramp, right? Oh, there were so many things that happened oh, in 2018. Yeah. So much drama, it's insane. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, sorry, so. This is, we're, we're in 2002, starting SpaceX. Um, Moved down to LA, um, and it was just it was pretty fun in the beginning. Like the, generally, startups are pretty fun in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, and and then you go through the, you know, chasm of doom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> chasm of doom. Yeah. The trough of sorrow. The trough of sorrow. The trough exactly. Of it's rough. Despair. Yeah, it's usually always like everyone's like super optimistic and excited for first <laughs> first year or so, and then the then things start to go awry, and the, there's usually many years of grief before this finally day dawns. Um, so yeah, so it's like yeah, 2002, um, and then about to. Let, so in 2003 is when um, uh, Rosen and JV Stravel called me up and said, hey, we want to have lunch. Um, I want to say Harold Rosen, I think that's his name. Um, but he, he, uh, he weirdly had, um, he was a pioneer in space technology and electric vehicles. Um, which is you know, odd crossover, uh, and he'd done something called Rosen Motors, which is like sort of an electric vehicle company, and um, but he'd, he'd also been pioneer in geostationary satellites. Uh, so uh, anyway, he called me up and said, "Hey, let's have lunch." Uh, so we had, we had like lunch at uh, like Smith and Walensky or something in Palop in El Segundo, where SpaceX started. Um, and so Stravel and Rosen were talking about space stuff and then started talking about electric cars and I said, oh yeah, you know, so I was going to be working on electric car technology at Stanford and uh, and uh, then JB said, uh, you know, we should uh, take a drive in the T0 from AC propulsion mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was like, yeah, you know because the, the the timing is, is like lithium ion batteries was really like the critical breakthrough needed for compelling electric cars, um, and so it's like okay I'll go try out their T zero, um, which had specs similar to the what we eventually brought to market as the Tesla Roadster. So then I so yeah so I got I got a ride in the T zero, and then I tried to convince. Um, Al Kakoni and Tom Gage to commercialize the T zero. Now the, the T zero, and there's like lots of stuff online about it. Um, it it you know it didn't have doors or a roof, so <laughs> like clearly you need to add those things uh, or any safety systems, um, and it was very unreliable um, because it was just like sort of a proof of concept basically. I heard it was basically like hand assembled. You guys really had trouble scaling it. No, it's. I mean, it literally didn't have doors or a, or a roof, <laughs> or any airbags, or a, an effective cooling system for the battery, um, and it, it was not safe, um, and it was very unreliable. <laughs> it would break down. It, like you, it need to be, babied by an engineer, or it would not. You couldn't use it. So, um, but nonetheless, it did get like zero to sixty. I think under, you know, under four seconds, uh, two hundred fifty mile range. Uh, it was enough to convince you that it was possible. I mean, I, I, I knew it was possible because if you go from um, 
the intersectionality have led us to to, um, to lithium ion. You've got about a four x energy density improvement. So if you've got if you've got say a sixty mile range with lead acid, you're going to have about a 250 mile range with, with lithium ion of the same weight. Um, so, but it was, it was cool to see it in action with, uh, with AC propulsion. Um, and I, I, so I, I tried hard to convince those guys, I could really pester them a lot to go into, to commercialize the, the T0. Um, and they just did not want to do it. Um, weirdly, the thing they wanted to make was uh, an electric scion. And I'm like, you guys, nobody's going to pay $70,000 for an electric scion, okay? <laughs> that was their idea, $70,000 for an electric scion. I'm like, this is not going to work, okay? <laughs> you will sell like 14 of these things. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> I'm like, I kid you not, I have like the email trails and these... Yeah, I mean, I think they're still still around. So, um, in fact, but I, I even say, listen, I, I, even though I think this is the dumbest idea ever, I I will, I will pay, I will fund one tenth of it. <laughs> if you can find nine other people, and I think the only other person they could find who would do it was Sergey Sergey Brin. So it's like okay, Sergey and I are the only ones willing to do this, I think, and so they didn't actually get it off the ground. But and I, I said it's going to fail, I <laughs> but at least it's, it's something. Um, and and so then eventually I said, I'm like, listen, if you guys are not going to commercialize the T zero, do you mind if I do it? Uh, and they're like, no, yeah, that'll be totally fine. I'm like, okay. Um, so, so then I was gonna. It's like okay. So I'm gonna go do this with with JV, and we'll we'll go commercialize, create a commercial version of the T zero, and and then um, Gage and Kakoni said, well, you know, there's some other people who also want to do it. Do you want to maybe team up with them? Um, he said there were two other groups that wanted to do it, and I was like, okay, sure. You know, this, maybe this is a way that I can have my cake and eat it too. You know. Uh, I think the last word. Never, never works out. God damn! Try to have your ca cake and eat it too, doesn't it? <laughs> this one's gonna be easy. No, I mean, well, I didn't think it would be easy, but it was like I thought maybe I can allocate like twenty to thirty hours a week and just work on product and engineering, and then other people can do those stuff. But I don't even like doing that stuff anyway. So um, that just didn't work out. So. Um, so then, then um, Tom Gage said, he said, he said there were two teams, but I only ever met one, and that was uh, Eberhard, Toppening, and Wright. Um, but like the thing that is really bugs me about them is like they, 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 Eberhard in particular, the worst guy I've ever worked with, and I want to make a note of this, he is literally yeah. the worst person I've ever worked with. <laughs> and I've worked with some real douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> To be number one <laughs> takes a lot. <laughs> it's not easy. His version of the story is like he, is that out of the blue he pitched me on on fund, on funding his electric car company, and 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 he convinced me to do it. Totally false. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was like, I'm creating an electric car company. It's like the engage said, well, maybe you could team up. It's like okay, well, maybe that that might be a, worth worth doing, and and so the, the the company ended up being basically five people. This is right, the uh, toppling, uh, you know, um, Everhard, Straubel, and myself, and and so it was the five of us, um, and the, like toppling always tries to write write right out of the history books because they had a huge battle and they made me choose which one was going to be CEO, it's uh, right or, or Everhard, and I talked to JB and I was like, which one, because I really did not want to be CEO. So and they're like, okay, well, both have issues, but maybe right has bigger issues than toughening, that's what JB said, so maybe, you know, lesser of evils, I was like, okay, fine, I got to make a choice here, because the two of them would not, they would not, they refused to be in the same building, so I was like, huh. 
a lot of drama. But Tessa has so much drama. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, it's not like the forgot, forgot, I said, like, you know, you know, lesser of two evils. So it's like, I said, you're yeah, right, sorry, you know, not that I didn't think he had good points, but. I gotta, if I gotta pick one, I, and I don't, I was trying not to be CEO, I gotta make this rocket company work. So, anyway, so then made, uh, you know, it was like, right, you know, it's like, I had to leave then. <sighs> anyway, um, so we got the, basically, we, 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 the, we jammed, uh, AC propulsion, powertrain, and battery pack into a Lotus Elise. Um, with the first prototyping, like really just jammed it in, you know. Um, and and the, and um, in retrospect, this was not a good idea uh, because the the car ended up weighing like like sixty percent more than an Elise or on that order. Um, and we didn't have enough volume to put the battery pack, uh, and, and we had to meet all, we invalidated all of the crash tests because the weight distribution was different, it was heavier, so none of the crash tests were valid anymore. We had to redo the airbags, the air conditioning, air conditioner ran off a belt fan, so we didn't have a belt fan, so we had to have a new air conditioning system, so we had to change the HVAC system, uh, and so basically, in the end, only about like, I think six or seven percent of the parts ended up being in common with an Elise. Wow. So, and, and we went through a lot of trouble trying to shoehorn everything in there. And it, I mean, it's a cute car, but it's ten percent too small. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then the cost ended up being crazy. Um, and um, yeah, and then, and then yeah. There was there was an audit of the costs of the the the, the, the production cost of the roadster by one of uh, the investors that joined in two thousand seven, and um, and then they, they they called me up and said, hey the the numbers that Martin is telling you that everyone's telling you about the roadster are totally false. Oh boy. Uh, and I was like, what do you mean? And I, like he said, no, we just did an audit. There, it's more than twice of what he's saying. The, nice. Yeah. Like we would have to sell this car for a quarter million dollars in order to make to not lose money. I was like, this is insane. Wow. So anyway, then he we obviously had to fire Everhard. Uh, there was no choice about that. Uh, yeah, and then it turned out he not only had he misled me directly, but he'd instructed others to also lie. Yeah. Yes, when I say like somebody is like the worst person I ever worked with. Yeah. Mm. It was pretty bad. Yeah. So, um, but SpaceX also hadn't gotten to orbit that time. So I was like, man. So then, I tried, so like, okay, I asked, um, what is the name? Uh, Harris. Um, remember the guy? Um, he, I'm blanking on the name. Yeah, we brought in the CEO. The interim. Uh. uh yeah, he he was, he ran like a manufacturing company. Um, I mean, he seemed pretty smart. The, pro the problem the problem that I found with Tesla was we were we were a startup in Silicon Valley, building a car that was really manufacturing and materials engineering, and it's really like all the talent was for you think we, we, there was probably talent you know in Detroit or Japan. But if you took any of those guys in to run Tesla, they would run out like a car company and then it would be destroyed. Well, they had no idea. You can take somebody who's running you, you a giant corporation. You just could not take someone from a massive company culture yeah. and have them do a startup. And yet, you couldn't find anyone in Silicon Valley who knew who knew enough about making cars. And so we kind of found a middle middle of the road one who was, he was, an, he was an expert Flextronics. in manufacturing. Flextronics. The, the, the ex-CEO of Flextronics uh, was an investor. Um, and he he agreed to just become join as interim CEO, and this is uh, two thousand seven. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Tesla was a company you tried so hard not to be CEO of. 
<laughs> yes. But the, the thing is, this is misinterpreted. As, if, if I say that, it's misinterpreted as like, I somehow don't love Tesla, which I do. Uh, it, it's just like a, trying not to go insane uh, with work. Yeah, you can, you, being CEO of a, of, a, of a real startup is 80 hours a week. Being CEO of two is 160 hours a week. And there's yeah. only 169 hours or something of sleep. Of, 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 of 168 hours a week. So like, you just can't physically do it. Yeah, I mean, the pain level is extreme. So uh, that's, yeah, I mean, let's try, let's try quite hard uh, not to, to be, to, you know, um, but had to be, uh, no, no choice. That or Tesla would die. So, so that, yeah, so Everhard got, was fired in July 2007. Um, and he was, he, was, he was, at the time, we didn't know he'd instructed other people to lie, so we thought he was just, you know, it wasn't as bad, but once he left the building, then we t it turned out, no, he'd actually orchestrated uh, this, uh, a massive deception, which is quite bad. Um, so, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, he also said he came up with the name of Tesla Motors, Motors which is false. That was uh, created by a guy in 95. Um, and, and moreover, he knows this because we so went to great length. We had to buy the trademark. Yeah, exactly. So you can come up with the name. It was, it was trademarked in 95. Um, <laughs> so it was like, it was a whole bullshit backstory of that. Um, but the, the guy, we almost, we almost had to change the name of the company because the guy who owned Tesla Motors uh, wouldn't communicate with us. Um, and so eventually we sent the nicest guy in the company, no, who's weirdly Martin's best friend, which I don't understand, but Mark Toppening, super nice guy. I like Mark a lot, actually. Yeah, you can't not like Mark, it's impossible. Um, he's a super nice guy, so we sent Mark to go sit on the guy's doorstep and not leave until he, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> until he agreed to at least negotiate with us or something, he talked to us. Um, and then we ended up buying the trademark for $75,000. Um, Good deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> was he the one who owned the domain too? No, that was a whole different <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> but, no, the domain guy, that took us 10 years to buy that Tesla.com domain. Um, man, and he, it was a, it is, I think, still an, um, like a networking engineer at Juniper. Uh, so, yeah, that was, and that cost us like $10 million. Yeah, that was crazy. Like just, the guy just held out. Yeah. Was he just sitting on the domain or was he using it for something? It was impossible to, no, he wasn't using it for anything. <laughs> um, just holding the name. It's like Twitter handle Falcon Heavy is being used. <laughs> <laughs> We're fighting for that one. <laughs> yeah, so man, that was, took us ages to buy the Tesla Um But we were gonna have to change the name to, to be, um, Something else, and actually, I, the the lead candidate was for, 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 was was Faraday as the name, because mm -hmm. Faraday invented the electric motor, mm -hmm. and then uh, Tesla perfected the electric motor with the AC induction motor. So it was, um, so it was, if, if we couldn't do Tesla, we would do Faraday, and then ironically, a competitor was, was later created called for, Faraday. Faraday, yes, yeah. a startup, from, yeah, from yeah. China, right? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, did you guys have a Faraday a logo or anything? Were you that far down? The no, track? Um, we didn't really even have a Tesla logo until later because there was nothing to sell or anything. So, um, it, it, the, the, but in the end, the, the Tesla logo and the Tesla font um, uh, was done by m me working with. <laughs> Uh, basically, a, a little firm. That's why the Tesla and SpaceX. Yeah. There, there's some similarities between the the, the, the fonts, and uh, that's because it was done by the same people. Nice. <laughs> cool. um, yeah, I spent a lot of time on the Tesla and SpaceX fonts. The, the, <laughs> get the little. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Um, Do you want to eat that? Yeah, sure. sure, sure. Excellent. All right. Awesome. 
It would be much easier if the if the world was flat, or if you're not, if you're in a flat situation. Where as soon as things are not flat, and you've got the the the, the world is like it has undulations and curves, and yeah. and then your the car can be at any kind of at any kind of angle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you if you accelerate or brake, it's actually going to t- t- tip a little bit. Yeah, you've got sort of pitch and your compensation. Uh, it's, it, that's where it gets really tricky. Yeah, I mean they're doing just amazing work. It literally just blows my mind every time. Like there's an update. Like you think it's like, wow, I can't believe it's this good, and then it just gets better. Like the big one was the faster lane changes. Like as you uh, push right. the turn signal, it's like like immediately. It's yeah. really yeah. awesome. That's so it's satisfying. Proof. Yeah, and love you know, that. You, I was kind of just like before. I was like, okay, it's not that good, but it feels good because like I can't believe a computer is doing this. Then we got the faster ones, and I was like, oh my god, it was so bad before. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it'll it'll be able to just do crazy maneuvers like like a high speed chase technically um, because it's it's you don't you always want to bias the thing to be conservative in any in the actions that it takes yeah. um, <clears throat> uh, but there's there's quite a significant foundational rewrite in the Tesla autopilot system that's almost complete um, as really? well yeah and what what part of the system like perception like planning or just like um if, it, it's it's instead of having uh, planning, perception, uh, image recognition all be separate, they're 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 being combined. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, I don't even understand what how, what that, what that yeah, means. <laughs> effectively, like the you know the sort of neural net is absorbing more and more of the problem. Right. Um, beyond simply the um, is this is if you see a, an image, is this a car or not, or, or what you know? Um, yeah. It's it's kind of what, what, where does it, what do you do from that? Um, mm-hmm. 3D labeling is the, the the next big thing, where the car can go through a scene with eight cameras, and 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 kind of paint a a a, a, a paint a path, and then you can lab, label the path in 3D. Um, this is probably two or three order of magnitude improvement in labeling efficiency and labeling accuracy. You know, two or three orders of improvement in labeling efficiency and significant improvement in labeling accuracy. As opposed to having to label individual frames from eight cameras at 36 frames a second. You just drive through the scene, re- rebuild that scene uh, as, as a 3D thing with it's just like there might be a thousand frames that were used to create that scene, and then you can label them all at once. Is that related to the dojo thing you mentioned at the autonomy day? No, dojo is for learning, for training the neural net. That's like when you're trying to build a neural net that you ship into the car, yeah. dojo speeds that up by hardware accelerating it. Yeah, exactly. Um, Are you guys, is that up and running yet? or? No, it might be, we might have the first one at the end of this year. Um, but next year, I think it's very likely next year, maybe this year. Um, but it's essentially meant to absorb massive amounts of video uh, input, um, and and then uh, and then um, tr- train against vast amounts of data, so that it can be used in the inference engine in the car. So it's just like a human, really. It's like how long does it take you to learn a subject versus do a subject? You know, it's like hard to learn, say, calculus. But once you learnt it, then you can, you know, integrate something fast or something. You know, it's like it's, it's a it's a, it's really the same yeah. same basic thing. Yeah, I mean that'll just really tighten the feedback loop. Like at some point, it just gets impossible to catch you guys. I mean, like the rest of the people haven't even really like started the rest of the auto industry, and like the feedback loop is just getting so tight with autopilot now. It's just like makes it a lot easier. I, th- I think they, I think it will. Th- they will catch up eventually, uh, well, or at least they will catch up to where Tesla is now. I, I don't know. I mean, things like, like for example, we're talking about maps and directions, and how today, like um, uh, computer-based na- navigation is is a trivial, a considered trivial. But you know, back in '95, it was not trivial. Right. Yeah. It was considered very hard, um, and the compute power you had was was tiny. So the the, the code had to be super tight. Um, can't, couldn't have fluffy code if you 
you know, trying to execute something on like a 386, you know, mm-hmm. like very, very puny amount of memory and compute. So, um, so now it's, but, but now maps and directions are, are, are easy. Um, I think in the, it, it, at some point in the future, it might be a decade or something, then autonomy will, will, will seem easy. Yeah. I mean, it'll obviously be commoditized in the long term. Yes. It will, it will, it will seem easy in 10 years. But there will be a long stretch there where it, it, there'll be vast differences between cars. Well, and I have, I have the, the auto industry it ha- is used to slow rates of improvement. So, um, you know, it's there's still not really a car yet that matches the original Model S. Maybe you could like yeah. take t- t- maybe. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at like the EPA ratings, it literally is just all below. Yeah. <laughs> so that was tw- that was 2012, and it's 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's still like pretty hard to get a car. Let's say that's there's there's, certainly, there's there's not a car available at the price of the Model S that has the capabilities of the Model S of 2012. It's kind of exactly what you were talking about with the Elise, where you're like, oh, we'll just put a battery in the Elise, and that kind of showed you like, okay, we really need a ground up electric design. Yeah. <clears throat> and the rest of the industry I mean, hasn't done that. I mean, the, 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 like the, the 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 sort of founding principles of Tesla were, were basically completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the the, 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 the the, the premise going in is like, it's not going to be that hard. You know, we'll just take the Lotus Elise, a, you know, a nice light, lightweight car, and we'll take uh, AC Propulsion's uh, drive unit technology, and we'll put them together, and we'll have an electric car, and it'll be great. <laughs> this sounds pretty easy. Yeah. Except uh, the AC Propulsion technology uh, could not be uh, industrialized. Like, it was like basically handcrafted electronics. Mm-hmm. With an analog motor controller, yeah, uh, and so depending if it was hot or cold, <laughs> your car would respond differently or not at all. <laughs> um, and the uh, yeah, motors were hand wound. It was just like uh, it was like impossible. You cannot scale this uh, technology. Uh, you, you can have like finicky, individually made, super expensive prototypes, but you could. It, it, we ended up using none of the AC propulsion technology. So. Um, yeah, you know, so something that looks cool and works well at an individual prototype level does not necessarily scale. Um, and then the, like I said, it was like maybe seven percent of the parts of the original Roadster were in common with the Lotus Elise. It would have been way easier if we started from a blank slate. Um, it would have been a better car. Um, so, but I think like the the real um, test of of any given startup is how well does it respond to adversity. Um, and adapt and, 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 and just figure it out, you know, so like most things are just when they start out, they're just, they don't make a lot of sense, but then as long as you adapt quickly, then you can make the company work. Um, and, um, you know, if if you say like sort of Confinity, you know, doing, doing palm pot to- tokens with an infrared port made no sense, but they adapted quickly to online payments. You know, that's that was that was key. Um, and um, yeah, at, at X.com, we, we, we were, was was originally going to buy it off way more than it could chew by trying to do all the banking services, and that also focused on payments. It's like if we do all these banking things, we're going to need a banking license. The banking license is going to slow us down. We just focus on payments. So we can just get a payment, uh, you know, license from, from the state, and it's just like. 50 bucks or something, you can be a money transmitter, <laughs> um, literally. And so you just got to adapt quickly. Um, you kind of need to be naive, though. If you had known as much about manufacturing, you might not have done it. Um, yeah. Yeah. This would have been, it would have been difficult to, I, I guess if you know the outcome is going to be good in the end, sure. It sort of depends on how much foreknowledge do you have about it. it manufacturing is, is insanely difficult. Uh, it's underappreciated in its difficulty. Yeah, no, that's totally true. Yeah. Uh, even making the Roadster, which you know, we only like, peak made about 600 Roadsters in a year. Um, but, you know, call it like t- 10 a week or something like that, you know, 10 or 12 a week. So, 
you know, if, we, if, if two got made in a day, that was a big day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, Tesla's making over a thousand cars a day now. What, what I find amazing is from start to finish, a car is made in 48 hours. Yeah, it depends on what counts start to finish for him. Yeah, it depends on what you, but, but you can see the rolled aluminum in one section of the factory and you can see the cars coming out the other end and it it's really amazing. is astounding and, and yeah. cars have been built for a long time but but this is just astounding. It's still, when you, you don't appreciate when you're driving a car how much goes into the level of detail, the 10,000 parts yeah. that come together, the shaping of everything. 10,000 unique parts. Unique like parts. Wow. With the uh, yeah, um, pack alone is several thousand cells. And it all comes together with people that are s- skilled but uh, you know, skills are changing as as things become a little bit. There's more. There's more autonomy, but it's not. It's not autonomy is not perfect. So you 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 do need to have a lot of people there, and um, and the, these cars have to be perfect. I mean, it's yeah. just yeah. Uh, just yeah. Call call the, if, given how much complexity there is in a car, it's remarkable that cost as little as they do. There's there's so much that's in a car. Um, so so what sort of processes do you remove? Like you know first principles type thing approach from the Elise to like the Model S like was it a massive jump there yeah I mean it's gigantic yeah Tesla had never made a car <clears throat> made a full car before um, the uh, Lotus made the non-powertrain portion of the, the Roadster and then Tesla built the battery pack motor um, power electronics charger uh, and then put put it all together at the end, um, and the <laughs> final assembly was actually at an old Ford dealership in Menlo Park. <laughs> that was um, you can see some of the stuff in Revenge of the Electric Car. Yeah, I've seen seen great that. movie. Oh, yeah, it's great. It just gives you crazy perspective to look back on it. Crazy. We need a third one. <laughs> yeah, I mean the idea of having a car like a car assembly tiny plant in Menlo Park of all places. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just because we, we, we managed to sublease the, the Ford dealership closed down uh-huh. and we managed to get it like this um, deal from Stanford because it, it's, the Stanford is going to redevelop it. And they, so they, and, and they, they're, well, we figured they'd probably take it way longer than they expected to redevelop it. So we said, well, you're not bringing it to anyone. Like, can we pay you like 50 cents a square foot and you can uh-huh. kick, us out, kick us out whenever you want? And, um, and it was this actually huge dealership wow. and it had enough room to do final assembly of the cars. So we just did final assembly of the cars there. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And, and the, one of the most absurd places to build cars on earth is Menlo Park. So no test track or anything, just the road outside or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, we, we, we'd actually, the early roasters were very unreliable. So, uh, we generally, uh, put about 50 miles of just dri- normal driving. Oh, so just wow. drive around the Bay area. Uh, with somebody following you, in must have got some crazy down. looks from people, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what is that? Yeah, but we put 50, 50 miles in each one of those cars because they just have a lot of things that would break down in the first fifty miles. Um, so, um, and then, um, yeah, battery production was in San Carlos. Um, yeah, so man, that was. There's just a lot of detail on that and all that. But going from the roadster to Model S was. A massive leap because uh, the, the the Model S is quite a sophisticated sedan where we Tesla built the whole thing as opposed to just building a powertrain and um, yeah so <clears throat> you know competing against like Mercedes BMW Audi type thing um, so that that was that was a massive leap of, of difficulty um, we, we did get the Numi plant but really that just meant we got a box yeah, because uh, they stripped the plant of, of all the the, the good equipment. <clears throat> the only equipment that Toyota and GM left behind was the stuff that um, that they could not use anywhere else. Wow! So they only left the most Trash. chunky, broken pieces of equipment behind. Um, we managed to use some of it, um, but but yeah, in, in the paint shop. Um, I mean, some of the things were literally not even worth the scrap value. <laughs> so, so it was like not worth it to call the scrap metal dealer. What'd you do wow. with it? Then? We made it. We we made a lot of those things work. Oh, you did. Yeah, plastic injection molding machines, and we just made them work. Wow. Um, and the paint robots, we mostly made those work. But the assembly, the the, the body production line had to be made new because that stripped. The, there was just nothing. So we made the body production line for Model S was uh, created from scratch. 
um, yeah, and it worked out, but it was very difficult. Um, it was also, also in the beginning, the the top suppliers would not work with us, uh, so, or, or we would get like their D team, because like who, who wants you know if if they like well, they got all these customers like they got you know the big car companies they got like Toyota or they got you know Audi and W Ford as customers and and a startup who now you're in, you're in the supplier's position which team are you going to assign to this <laughs> startup that everyone says is going bankrupt. <laughs> You're going to assign, assign the interns and rejects. <laughs> okay, it's not going to be your top team. We have the same thing with our Your top team's going to go to like Toyota, <laughs> you know, your big customers, the top team. So we would get the worst team usually at the supplier company if the supplier would even work with us. You think that influenced you to vertically integrate more? No, it was vertically integrate or die. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. No, we, we tried outsourcing. The battery production originally was going to be made uh, at this... Uh, place that made I think barbecue grills in Thailand um, <laughs> I read this story. <laughs> yeah and I was like man they, they have no idea how to make, make a battery and, and, and I, I was like this is crazy we're moving it to um, back to our headquarters in St. Carlos um, and we're just gonna make it here because uh, the, the basically the, once there's a massive amount of work going from a prototype to production mm-hmm. um, and you so you need a fast feedback loop with engineering and if, if if that feedback loop is all the way out in, in Thailand, it's just no way. It's, it's, not, it's not like it's not like it's if, if you have an existing production line that you already know how to make it in volume, that you can move. Mm. But you cannot create a production line that never existed that's super far away from where the engineers are. Mm-hmm. It's gonna it's a recipe for disaster. Um, and also the, the cells were coming from Japan, so they go from Japan, they go to, to Thailand, they go through customs, they'd be waiting, and that, then they'd be go, going to a battery pack, then that battery pack would be sent to England, then Lotus, if this is, a, this is, this is these are all things that got changed. Mm-hmm. But the supply chain, like let's say there'd been a problem with the cells, you'd only find, if the supply chain was changed so long that you'd only find out that it didn't work five months later. Yikes. Yeah, and then you have five months of, of scrap inventory. So this is, this is a recipe for a disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that got moved to uh, San Carlos. Sh- cells shipped directly to San Carlos, put it in a module, figure out why the module's not working, fix it, make, put it into a pack. <clears throat> like the original reason why the Roaster battery pack had, like, I think it was like 16 sort of blades, was if was one, modules, if, with the, if one of them didn't work, you could pull it out and put another one in. <laughs> Because <laughs> that, that happened, um, then we, then yeah. So we, you don't really need modules, in my view. You should just go from cells to pack at this point. But um, yeah, it was a very difficult thing going from Rosa to Model S. The fact that like the Model Three still has modules is kind of vestigial. It's vestigial, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, it, because it, the, the modules, the Model Three are not actually interchangeable, mm-hmm. so. There's no point in having modules, really. You just have a, we should just have a pack. Um, was that done to just save cost, then, or, or some other reason? It, it started off because <laughs> it's, it's not it's not a sensible reason. Um, <laughs> the, the, the the reason that there were uh, cells, modules, and pack goes back to the early roadster days, where we'd make a module. That module would have uh, problems. And so then you could swap out a module. It's like a, like a server rack. The idea was like, you know, if you have a bunch of servers in, in a server room and one of the servers flakes out, you can pull it out and put another one in. So without having to replace, so, so you could replace a small fraction of the pack instead of the whole pack. Um, then, then that concept just carried forward into model S, X, and three, oh. but without the, but the, the original logic no longer exists because the modules are not interchangeable. Yeah. You can't just swap out a module, um, uh, so but, but these things just have a lot of inertia. <laughs> um, so we, we really want to move to n- no such thing as a module. There's just cells and pack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, initially they had the uh, battery swap facility right at Har- Harris Range. Yes. Uh, I mean, and then the Model Three. I don't think it had that capability that you could actually swap the whole pack out quickly, right? Um, or I don't Correct. know if that it was, does yeah, not. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. S and X still have the ability to do a fast pack swap. 
Um, But things essentially evolved in the same direction that phones evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, for a long time, phones had swappable battery packs. Mm -hmm. And now, basically, nobody, almost nobody makes a phone with a swappable battery pack. Definitely. Um, As soon as the range gets past a certain point, then... I agree. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. But but this was far from clear at the time of, of designing the Model S. So we went to a lot of trouble to make the, the S and X pack capable of a, of a fast swap with quick disconnects and bolts coming in only from the bottom and that kind of thing. And then we did that demo where yeah. we just swapped out two packs faster than some, you could yeah, pull a gas tank. That's amazing. Um, it's kind of ridiculous to me, like taking the battery out of your car just in, you know, Harris Ranch and <laughs> they put a new battery in and you come back. It was kind of like... I'm, it's good that supercharging got a lot better. <laughs> yeah, it, it was just way better to to in, increase the range of the pack and have better, faster charging. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, but but this, this 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 debate, which seems obvious in retrospect, was not obvious at the time. Definitely. Um, and and um, you know, back then, I think at least I don't know, a lot of phones had swappable packs because mm-hmm. um, remember this was sort of would have been designed in. You know, we, we had the first prototype out in 2010 for the Model S. Uh, so back in 2010, let's say we, the, the thought process going into this in 2009 would have been, you know, at a time when, I don't know, maybe most phones had swappable packs or something like that, you know. The iPhone was like 2007 or something, iPhone 1. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, so that, so then it, it, it doesn't didn't make sense. But, but, you know, companies have a lot of momentum, so the... The SNX pack is still a swappable pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it was like too much trouble to change the design. And Model 3 still has modules, even though it shouldn't have modules. <laughs> um, and in some degree, like, like what you'll see in any given product is that the the the, the errors in, in the, the structure of an organization will manifest themselves in the product. So, you know, that, that's where, it, well, we have a module team, so we have modules. Like, wait a second, we just combine the module team with the pack team, and then there will be modules. Um, so generally, the, you, you, the, yeah, the errors in the organization manifest themselves in the product. Um, you, you, you can see where the organizational boundaries are. <laughs> uh, and, and, that, and then you'll often get, like, a box in a box. It's like, wait, why does this thing have two boxes? <laughs> well, because this team wanted to have an enclosure, and this team wanted to have an enclosure. And so they, they have an enclosure on an enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> and this is still the case with the, even the it sound, it's like how, what a silly thing, but that's actually the case with the Model 3. Mm-hmm. Model 3 battery pack has a, a top enclosure, and the car also has an underbody. Yep. What's the point of that? That doesn't make any sense. Because <laughs> the, pack, the pack team wanted to have an enclosed battery pack, and, and the, the body team wanted to have an enclosed body. Yeah, it makes sense. But you don't need two. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. So this is all this. And, 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 put, and putting the top cover on the battery pack is a big pain in the neck. So it adds mass and cost and stuff. So that should definitely go away in the future. Um, lots of brackets on brackets, that kind of thing. So, so you survived the production hell of the Model 3, <laughs> which was... Um pretty intense I mean that, that was like ins- stupendously difficult um, and I mean I think it's sort of um, t- it has a I don't know if this is accurate or not but I think it might be accurate is the first company car company to reach volume production I think in a, on an 80 80 or 90 years or something mm-hmm. like that in the US that's wow that's, yeah and, it was, and it's a harder time to do it for sure yeah the complexity of, of like what people ex- the, the regulatory requirements and the minimum expectations for a, a car at this point are dramatically more than they were eighty or ninety years ago. And the place you chose to do it too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was it was a super difficult one. Um, I mean, there's like there's lots of car company startups, but that's doing the prototype is the easy part. Do, building the production system is. A hundred times hotter. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where you see the, the things fail. Like, yeah. there have been, over the course of the last century, probably thousands of car company startups, most of which people have never heard about. You know, occasionally they'll hear about something like a DeLorean or a Tucker. Most of them, 
this there's there's not even a footnote um, and it's it's because of the difficulty of production um, and then and here's a real important point that is not well appreciated this is a point that should be advanced by short sellers but I have not seen it <laughs> I've not seen it articulated but it should be um, the the, the, the incumbent car companies make uh, most of their money from selling spare parts to their existing fleet mm -hmm. at high margins. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll sell the new cars uh, either at, at, at de facto zero margin or even at a loss. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, printers and cartridges or razors and blades. Mm -hmm. you, you sell the ra razor at a loss, sell the razor profit, sell the printer at a loss, sell the uh, cartridges that are profit or, or video game consoles. Um, you know, the actual cost of, say, an Xbox is $600, but you can buy it for three or $400 because they make it up on in the games that are bored. Yeah. Yeah. So, th th this is... this, this th now. They, so, if you're a new company, you do not have a fleet. Mm -hmm. so, you, so, you have no fleet with which to subsidize the, the sale of your new cars. This is the... This is the primary reason there has not been a successful car company startup in the United States. This is the primary reason. Um, so, um, because the incumbent car companies have 80% of their fleet outside of warranty or something like that, maybe it's 70%, but approximately. Like if a car lasts for, say, 20 years or something like that, and the, the warranty is for four years, then it's 80% out, uh, out of warranty. So, um, even if they stopped selling new cars, they would still, um, their the, the profit would increase. <laughs> so, according to Edmonds, dealerships make twenty percent of their revenue, but fifty percent of their profits on service. Yeah, exactly. So, and 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 the the, the car companies themselves will often make more than a hundred percent of their profit on 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 selling spare parts. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So so. If, if like if, if the point at which they're making say 110 percent of the profit from selling spare parts, it means that they're actually selling the new cars at a loss. So this this, this is a this is the very difficult thing to overcome. Um, in order to overcome it, the um, a, the a car has to be significantly more compelling than uh, other than other vehicles, such that people are willing to pay a premium, um, and that you can actually be um, positive cash flow, um, aspirationally profitable, selling new cars, not simply selling spare parts to the fleet. Um, so, I mean, for Tesla's fleet is probably 10% of Tesla's fleet, or something less than 20% is out of warranty, whereas 80% of the other car makers is out of warranty. So, um, this makes it very difficult. Uh, also, electric cars need much less servicing. So. Uh, that that's another difficult thing. So so th this is this is the main this this should be the main argument advanced I think for why a car, car a new car company cannot be successful the, the main one. Um, and so yeah then like I said the, the the in order for that car to have car company to have any chance there must be it must be compelling enough that people will pay for you otherwise there's no chance. Um, and I think there's actually, in order for a car company to be successful, it has to succeed on two, on two fundamental technology discontinuities. One being electrification, and the other one being autonomy. I think not even even pure electrification by itself is not enough. Mm -hmm. like, so you can, yeah. can um, like since the moving production line, there there have been two major technology step changes, being electrification and autonomy. And the combination of those two is the only, th is, that's the only opening for a new car company to make it. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, it, it, without autonomy, you'd probably have to wait for EVs to reach price parity. With, aut with autonomy, you can drive many more miles and bridge that gap easier. And it's like, well, Tesla's moat in some ways, or uh, not moat, I guess, but um, like Tesla's advantage in many ways is bigger because like these are two such different technologies that are happening at once that you've been working on while nobody else has. So it's like that much harder to replicate now that it's been accomplished almost. <clears throat> it's very hard for, it's very hard for any, any, any new car company to enter the market. Um, 
they, they have to make a very compelling product. Um, meaning they have to have some significant technology advancements in the electric drive drive train and the battery pack, um, and just generally with the car itself. Um, and then the autonomy has to be very compelling. But autonomy in and of itself is enormous. Um, so the both of those things um, a company must be successful in doing, or they will uh, end up in the cemetery. So that's that's the real challenge of it. Um, yeah. Well, even with like the, I mean, the software updates. I mean, that's something that no other manufacturer can really even get right. They can't do it over the air. You yeah. Have to take your car in to, you know, because it doesn't work, right? So that's a core component of providing uh, updates instead of getting your revenue now from the dealership and uh, spare parts and stuff. You can actually send software as a service. You know, we actually did a yeah. whole podcast on this. Uh, well, our goal is to minimize service costs. Yeah. Um, whereas the other car companies, this is. I wouldn't say the goal is to maximize service costs, but it's certainly not to minimize it. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> well, car companies also have two different businesses. There's the dealerships where their business is actually just service. Uh, and and um, uh, I don't more, think it's anyone surprised that, that people don't like going to their dealer. I mean, it's like, uh, it's, it's because their incentives are, are actually not aligned with the, with the customer's assent, uh, incentives. They, their goal is to bring you back as often as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were, the, the dealerships in San also misaligned with the the car companies in the during the warranty period because the war, the car company has to right. pay, pay for the the, the warranty that the service during warranty. Uh, so it's so it's that they have a this a conflict of economic conflict conflict of interests. Um, yeah, the car companies cover the warranty costs, but the the dealership uh, makes profit on the servicing. So they want to maximize servicing even during the warranty period. Yeah, it's almost like the economic factors you just mentioned have created like complacency where there is no innovation because, you know, nobody can just start a car company. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like Schumpeter's d- d- creative destru- destruction. You know, there's like... Innovation tends to come from new entrants to an industry. So if there's, if, if an industry has formed an olig- oligopoly or something like that, then the, the forcing function is, is weak for innovation because innovation tends to come from new entrants. Yeah, so this is a problem with rockets. There's not, not a lot of new entrants. So innovation forcing function is weak. But it's encouraging to see Rocket Booster land. Yeah. And everyone is all like, wow, we can innovate, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's actually been surprising how little innovation has been on the. And despite SpaceX showing reusable rockets, landing and reflying these rockets many times, the, and we're like, come on, you know, <laughs> just copy it <laughs> or something. <laughs> same with um, Tesla. I mean, yeah. yeah. Tech works, just do the same thing. Didn't like Chinese space companies started putting grid fins on their rockets? I think there's some Chinese rockets that have launched with grid fins. Um, well, you can really use any kind of fin. Um, grid fins just are more predictable across a wide range of speeds. So from hypersonic through, you know, supersonic, transonic, subsonic, uh, they're they're just it's quite easy to predict the um, behavior of a grid fin and the center of pressure where a grid fin doesn't change that much whereas if you have a, 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 a you know fin fin like a wing looking thing that you'll see quite a big change in where the center of pressure is uh, across a wide Mach regime yeah, either one would work <laughs> the shuttle didn't have grid fins <laughs> What do you think about Rocket Lab's approach of trying to um, use a helicopter to recover the first stage? Uh, yeah, um, I think that's going to be harder than it seems. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, but the, the their booster is quite small, so the the, the issue with with helicopters is you run into a max load problem. Like the lifting capability of helicopters is not that great, um, and that lifting capability drops with altitude. Uh, and then the range of helicopters was not that great. So, so then you end up having to have the helicopter on a ship, um, and then if in bad, in heavy weather conditions, you can't take off. 
Uh, so that you're gonna, you have to be your weather constraints at the launch point and the catch point are um, end up limiting your launch availability. Mm. Um, and then, then you, you got to, it's 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 dangerous. You know, you've got somebody in a helicopter with, with, with a you know pilot trying to catch this thing coming out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's, it doesn't sound too sane. It, it, there's a, there's certainly the potential for somebody you know something to go wrong. Um, whereas if you have a drone ship, this you know if, if it smashes into the drone ship, it's not a big deal. If it smashes into a helicopter, that's a big deal. Sure. Yeah. So. You know, overall, I've been you know that that said, I've been pretty impressed with Rocket Lab, and they're ma- they're making they're making a go of it, um, and they're they're going to you know, do reusability, which is important. It's fundamental. Um, do you guys still see yourself doing that city to city travel in thirty minutes one day? That would be awesome. I want to do yeah, <laughs> yeah. more stuff. Yeah, I think that can for sure can be done. Yeah, for sure it can be done. It, it is. It is loud. Uh, that's that. It's really a noise is the the, uh, the biggest concern there. Both taking off and landing. When it comes in for landing, that sonic boom is loud. <laughs> um, it, it's like yeah. There's actually two sonic booms. Uh, so it, it sounds like somebody just discharged a double barrel shotgun in your backyard. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it's breaking windows or anything, but it's like it'd be pretty annoying if it's happening on a regular basis. <laughs> you know, that's basically what it amounts to. So then you have to do it offshore. Um, so I think we'll do. But it, it, can it be done? Definitely. Um, and it's the fastest way to get anywhere based on known physics. So. And I think the economics can be made to work as well, so that it would be competitive with international air travel. It'd be exciting. Wow. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Wow. I can't wait for that. I yeah. travel a lot, like, to Asia, like, minimum, like, 12 hour to 14 hours. Sure. Yeah. Will you try to keep most of the launches around the equator? Just, or would it matter? Like, um, it, it doesn't matter a ton. Um, it it, it 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 matters if you're going east to you know, if, if if you if you if you launch east you have the advantage of the Earth's rotation mm-hmm. the closer you are to the equator the more you can take advantage of Earth rotation mm-hmm. um, if you if you fly west you're actually counteracting Earth, Earth's rotation so your the delta velocity that you need is is higher um, but you can go in either direction. Um, I think one of our one of our upcoming launches is actually a retrograde retrograde flight, so it's going to go against the Earth's rotation. That'll be that'll be fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. But if Starship is going to launch so many times a day, how are you going to produce all these Raptors? Because mm. like, we've been we've been touring uh, the SpaceX factory in Orthon, and you're doing you're making them by hand, right? Are you going to automate Rutgers? any of this? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's being made by hand. The uh, being assembled by hand, maybe, but yeah, that's what I mean. Sorry. Uh, we have a lot of metal printers. We have a whole yeah, that's incredible. Three D printers are crazy. Three D metal yeah. printing, yeah. wow, crazy. yeah, love it. I mean, I think SpaceX is pushing the envelope for metal printing more than anyone else. Uh, at least that's what the suppliers tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but we also have a foundry uh, that, that so cool. we, we do our casting of exotic parts for a Raptor. Um, with a lot of CNC machines, it's a very complicated uh, engine to build. Um, a Merlin looks like a toy relative to Raptor. It's very simple. But we're we're, we're going to make a lot of Raptors and Starships. So are they all going to be made in the states then? Yes. Okay, they'd have to be. But... They have to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we can get simple ingredients from outside the U.S., but other than that, we're not we're we're, we're not allowed Australia. to transmit. Uh, any sort of NASA IP. yeah NASA yeah yeah mm-hmm. no 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 like anything that like is a sophisticated element of a rocket engine we're not allowed to transfer out the U S or, or yeah rock, rockety mm-hmm. stuff is the weapons technology so so just the Starship when it's assembled will fly there and come back <laughs> 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 so well, technically there's a lot of rockets 
at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> push out. <laughs> and they have. This is true. So if your city to city rocket travel works, does that mean Tesla doesn't need to build an electric airplane? <sighs> Man, <laughs> building an electric airplane has a lot of difficulty associated with that. Or what about the VTOL jet? It's a lot of difficulty associated with that. I, I, I gotta make sure, well, it takes a massive amount of effort to do any one of these things. So you can't do them all, it's not possible. Um, you say, say, oh, how are you allocate the resources? What's the best thing to do? Um, making a VTOL jet can definitely be done. Um, doing electric aircraft for sure. I mean, all, all transport will go electric except for rockets. Um, yeah, everything. I guess why it seems exciting is because if Tesla's leading in energy density and battery technology, then the logical next step is like, if somebody's going to build an electric airplane, it's the company with the best, lightest, most efficient batteries, right? Yeah, it's it's not, it's just, it's hard to, it's an entirely different regulatory regime. Um, it, like there's, there, there aren't any car companies that are also aircraft companies. So why don't they just make aircraft? Yeah, actually, you know, it's kind of funny. There was like some conspiracy theories on Twitter because on Instagram, Tesla's yeah. category, oh, yeah. it said automotive and then somehow aircrafts it's and got boats, boats got in added. Yeah. Boats? <laughs> like at the Cybertruck yeah. event, they changed. Yeah. Yeah. So like, more cyber truck they're making a boat or an airplane. <laughs> this is like your Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's incredibly hard to bring an aircraft to production and meet all of the regulatory uh, requirements worldwide where it's a very difficult thing so it's not like we could it's, it's something that could just be done uh, we would have to not do a bunch of other things it, it's not like there's like a ton of unallocated resources that tells on like oh what should we do now um, it's like a, a constant resource starvation so then it's like why don't you do this other thing okay well, we're starving for resources then what will you not do? Well, it seems like that's what's so exciting is now that the business has kind of taken this next step, the resource like starve is kind of changing or hopefully slowly changing. I mean, an airplane, like maybe another car or something. It's not. Yeah, not necessarily yeah, in airplanes, but I'm just in general, it seems like the financial help means you can spend more on R&D. You can invest more like. That's not how it works. It's not like if you just had more money, you could spend it effectively in R&D. But if, if there was a if there was a factory producing excellent engineers, that would be true. <laughs> where, where is this factory? <laughs> Doesn't exist. Um, so it's incredibly difficult to find the, the right talent, integrate them into an organization, and have it be work effectively. Uh, it's not a money thing. Um, it's just hard to find. There's just a short number, a small number of people. You know, more and engineers. Especially, um, there's just a fundamental limitation on exceptional engineers. Mm -hmm. There's just not that many. So given like these constraints and all the things you have to do, could you tell us like a little bit about your thinking on how you prioritize? And the prioritize, prioritizing has usually been out of desperation, not choice. <laughs> It's, it's not like, oh, let's sit back and well, how should we spend these resources? Like, this damn thing isn't going to work. We're gonna, if we don't make it work, we're going to go bankrupt. So, <laughs> you know, and then, so we better make it work. Um, I mean, um, the, the Model 3 program, there were so many mistakes that were made with the Model 3 program that the entire company had to be devoted to fixing the Model 3 production system. So, uh, you know, we, we, we took everyone off solar, almost everyone off um, battery pack, power wall, power pack, and that kind of thing. Um, anyone who was working on, you know, uh, Roadster, Semi, everyone, yeah. stop doing that, work on Model 3 or there won't be any Tesla. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. You really bet the whole company to get to this next level. But, you know, I mean, I have a Model 3. I couldn't afford a Model S. So, like, I'm very thankful that you guys decided to bet the whole company. There was no choice. Uh, it's like either you, you, you got you to gotta get to volume. It's a chicken and egg situation. You can't make the car 
at an affordable price unless you have high volume. Unless you have high volume, you can't get an affordable price. Yes. So now what do you do? Yeah. How do you bootstrap this thing? You, you basically just got to take a giant flying leap at high volume and hope you get to the, you, you know, you grab a cliff at ledge with your fingertips. Yeah, it seems like it's like that Indiana Jones where you're strength. like running down the thing, and this yeah. okay, that's the here's what it actually feels like. It's like that what Temple are doing, whatever you yeah. know. Where it's like there's a damn boulder yes. yeah. chasing you down. Okay, <laughs> shoot, and there's a big hole in the ground. Can you make that game? <laughs> and you're gonna yeah. jump across the hole in the ground, <laughs> and if you slow down, the boulder's gonna crush you. Oh <laughs> this is what it feels like. It's it's not like I wonder what you wish will do. It's like <laughs> boulder. A hole in the ground and then jump across or you're going to die so that's basically uh, or you know get, uh, the situation um, it, you know like at, like at this point maybe we could say like okay what shall we do at this point um, you know the the biggest problem we, we have to solve right now is just having production on each continent um, because it's insane to be making cars in California, shipping them to Europe and, and Asia. This is, I mean, as it is, making cars in the Bay Area is pretty absurd. Um, yeah. And then you also got to ship those cars halfway around the world. Um, so you got all this finished goods inventory on the water that's very high capital carrying cost. And you can finance part of it, but not all of it. Um, so, you know, then... Um, you have got the transport costs, you got tariffs, uh, um, you got, you know, every time a car gets loaded or unloaded, there's some potential for damage, it's mm -hmm. not zero, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it just creates a lot of cost and, and, and then it's hard to manage. And the, the factory complexity in California is, is amplified because you've got several different regulatory regimes. So you're building, it seems like you're building Model 3, but you're actually building several versions of a Model 3 depending upon whether it's going to China, Japan, Australia, uh, Europe. Uh, then you've got goddamn right-hand drive. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it's like, put the, the, every night, everything's going to go <laughs> over here. Which <laughs> <laughs> some random bureaucratic decision 100 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right-hand drive, left-hand drive? This is a mega pain in the ass. Put <laughs> <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and then all these different languages, you, get, you know, you can't have like warning labels in English if it's, they don't speak English. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, so there's stickers all over the place for, you know, 17 different languages or whatever it is. Um, and that's all in one factory. So, so, so the complexity amplifies the difficulty of manufacturing and then um, you kind of get into the cycle where in the first uh, month in the quarter or let's say first six weeks in the quarter you build cars for uh, Europe and Asia and you get them on the boats um, and then for the next say three weeks you build cars for the east coast of the US or North America and then the final three weeks you build coast cars for the west coast so our, the, the deliveries early in the quarter look look very very low and they spike exponentially at the end because basically all the cars arrive at the customers at the end of the quarter mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and they were like we, then, then we'll have these conversations we've got to get out of this wave like, and they're like well, we'll, they'll punish us very badly if we get out of the wave because the financials will look horrible yeah um, so then we end up okay we'll do the wave again um, <laughs> And so that so now we've got a factory in Shanghai that should uh, that that'll go a long way towards alleviating the complexity and the cost. Um, you know we'll have far fewer goods that we need to to finance that are on boats. Uh, if we get, you know, once we get the factory going in, in Berlin, or Brandenburg technically, um, which is close to Berlin, <laughs> <laughs> um, then then. Then that this massively reduces the complexity of production and, uh, and 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 reduces the fundamental cost of the vehicle. So th this will really de-stress the company a lot. So local production will break the wave. Lo local production will break the wave. Um, I, I mean, just like we've had the number of times that headlights have come up as an issue is is crazy. We've had to ship cars to Europe 
many times where the, the the supplier of the headlights for the EU headlights couldn't match rate, uh, and and the, or made them wrong or something, and, and then so we may have to make cars with U.S. headlights, ship them to Europe, then ship a bunch of EU headlights to Europe, change them in the port because they're not allowed to exit the port until they have the EU headlights. Oh my God! So that was the port problems we would see. That's one of the many port problems. Mm, yeah. Wow! Wow! So I, I, it, like like first year quarter last year was a tragedy of mm-hmm. errors. <laughs> not a comedy, but a tragedy. <laughs> um, and Belgium went on strike. Oh. Right, and, and, the, and you're like, what do you mean the Belgium's on strike? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. The, so, <laughs> a, 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 a lot of cars were coming into Zabruge, and, and we're like, okay, now what do we do? Nothing. Oh, yeah. Just cars are stuck. Because, okay. But they, then they're scheduled to go off strike on this other day, and like, okay, so then we can move things. Great. Um, you know, it was just so many, wow. so many things. And cars got stuck in the port of Shanghai because they had the wrong sticker. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Put the wrong sticker. did the sticker man? Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> it's better off like just made it in China. Like Absolutely, China. for sure. <laughs> like, totally agree. You don't have to spend like. Two weeks, three weeks, on the ocean, go there and roll sticker, and you have to wait yeah, and replace. Painful. People don't appreciate Giga Shanghai yet completely. N- not until recently. Not, 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 not yet. Not yet. I not don't think people fully. have realized it. Not fully. <laughs> it's extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and these like shipping times are like 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 technically it's possible if everything goes right you yeah. can get the the cars in two weeks yeah. but the ships don't don't leave every single day exactly. and and then you also have to queue you you can't just instantly load the cars <laughs> <laughs> like, so the cars you have to like send like two thousand cars to a lot in like you know Port Oakland or Port of San Francisco yeah. uh, accumulate the cars move then they get moved to another place then they get loaded onto the ship one at a time oh my god and then finally the ship leaves and then, <laughs> and then like sometimes the ship has problems yes and, and, and you know, like the storms or something storm and custom <laughs> yeah yes. no, like it's, it's you not have like, to go through everything it's so much drama oh, then this, this ship, too many ways to go wrong like, so, yeah and then like yeah. the ship's engine broke down it's so just like oh it's stuck somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah but it's great like right now like Everything roll off the production line, go directly to the the yeah, yeah, center. Great. It's wonderful. So I have another question. It's like, from your perspective, how do Chinese public perceive EV? Well, China is very pro EV, I and mean, it's the biggest EV market in the world. Um, uh, I think it's, it's like half of all the EVs are made and bought in China. Yeah, something like that. Right now, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, now, now ch- the ch- China uh, sort of um, s- subsidies for EVs mm-hmm. have dropped considerably, yeah. so that did cause a reduction. Helps a lot, yeah. Well, it, but it, the, the, EV, the EV incentives were very high in China, yeah. and now they're much less. Much less. They're like a third of what they used to be, or, or less. Yes. Um, so the so that's caused some decline in demand, as one would expect, um, but. I st- it's still China is still the biggest market for EVs in the world, so I think they're very positively received. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So t- talking about the incentives, because you, I know the uh, the price there was a small price reduction right in the Chinese uh, Model Three, and then but then the subsidies were the balance, so it's actually not it, it's not um, any impact on Tesla in, in the profit, right? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think the um, obviously the, the, depending on what percentage of the car is made in China, the, the parts that are made in China are not subject to a tariff, so that's mm-hmm. certainly helpful. Um, we also um, save on logistics, um, and uh, generally we found that uh, locally sourced parts in China cost less than in the you know, in the U.S. or Europe. So this is all pretty helpful. Um, also the Tesla got added to the purchase tax exemption, yeah, which, yeah. The, which all, all the other. This is. I'm, I'm not sure if people like realize just how much of an uphill battle Tesla has had to um, sell cars in China. It's been a, you know, really. We had basically no access to 
uh, any of the subsidies and we paid a tariff and we had to ship the cars over yes. and every single thing was set against Tesla and still we made progress and did decently well. So I think that it will be much better, a much better situation with local production, not having to do shipping and tariffs and um, and being able to have lower cost local sourcing of, of components. Um, so it would make a big difference, I think. Is that your victory dance when you broke ground in China? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so that was great. It's a big deal. Yeah, it is a big Huge. deal. Huge. Um, yeah, just uh, the, the, in terms of just fundamental economics, it kind of makes sense that making cars on the continent where they are bought will be a lot more efficient than making them in California and shipping them around the world. Yeah. yeah. And you can get paid for the cars before paying your suppliers, which seems to not be the case if you're shipping around the world. Right. And that could be a the, huge like friction on the whole kind of cash flow situation, or it has been. For sure, it will sure make a big difference on cash flow because yeah, it's um, there's just no way to get the cars, especially to Europe, but but even to China, to get them to customers, you know, um, f- before we have to pay suppliers. Um, so if you're a rapidly growing company. It's it's night and day if uh, if you um, get paid by your customers before you have to pay your suppliers like night and day uh, because then the faster you grow the better your cash cash position is mm-hmm. but if it's the other way around where you have to pay your suppliers before you get paid for customers get paid by customers then the faster you grow the the faster your cash yeah. position drops yes drop, yes because you're going to so, spend more money to. Making yeah, so, so gro- growth yeah. actually causes you to auger into the ground in a situation like that. Um, now, it tells you we had a mixture of both things where we had a lot of customers in, say, in California, um, and, and that's that's fast. For sure, we, we would get paid by customers faster than we would have to pay suppliers. But then for cars going to Europe and Asia, uh, there's, it's the other way around. Mm-hmm. you know. So we, we would have to pay suppliers before we got paid by, by customers. Um, and now we could offset, we could offset some of that with an, the asset backed line, which was pretty helpful, but only some of it, not all of it. Um, so the just the, the fundamental financial health for sure improves dramatically by just having just by having a, a factory on the continent. Okay, we're not talking next door, but <laughs> it, it, it's just how many oceans, you know, it's like especially Europe was logistically super hard because. We're on the West Coast. If we're on the East Coast, then then China would be much harder. But if yes. but if you're on the West Coast, Europe's much harder because you've got to go through the Panama Canal, or even worse, around the side of, you know Tierra del Fuego. Because <laughs> like, sometimes the Pan- Panama Canal get backed up, yeah. and you're like this yeah. friggin' ship is going to the Antarctic. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's like you just go up to the end, <laughs> and it's stormy as hell. <laughs> so you got to send a ship around Chile? Are you kidding? You know, in in the middle of crazy storms and, and then back up all the way and then like, you know, it, it is, it's, oh my God. Um, um, so logistic nightmare. Um, so yeah, it'd be, be great to just have have it not get on a boat. And, and cross the Pacific and Atlantic and that kind of thing. So maybe similar to Vincent's question, Ali, what's the biggest advantage in choosing Berlin compared to other European countries? Berlin has the best nightclubs. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Have you been? <laughs> yeah, I've been I, went to, I went to Bergheim once. Really? Yeah, yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so for so several years ago. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, we looked at a lot of different different locations, and um, I mean, sort of. I don't know. I we, we could have put it in a lot of locations. We, we needed to move move quickly, and and um, actually, this this place, um, um, you know, it's, it's like whatever. 30 minutes to the outskirts of Berlin, technically in Brandenburg. It, it actually was a place, location that uh, BMW was going to put a plant there. Mm-hmm. Um, so a ton of the environmental work and all of the permits and stuff had already been done. Yeah. And then for some reason, BMW chose a different location. Um, but 
there's like I guess or something on the order of a year's work uh, worth of environmental um, you know paperwork and stuff that's been done on that location for an auto plant. Awesome. Um, so that awesome. it made it one of the f- quickest places to get going, um, and the generally like the the, the government lo- local and state government was very supportive. Um, so you know I went there and it's like okay this seems like some pretty good vibes this place. So it's a lo- lovely part of this lovely place, um, and there's an opportunity for like it's it's close enough to Berlin that say young people could still you know, live in an apartment in Berlin and commute to the factory. It's right, there's a train sta- station. They're actually going to move the train station. It's a small train station, but they're going to move the train station to where you can literally get off the train and be right at the Giga Berlin. Oh, wow. wow. That's great. great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's perfect. You could literally just pop right off and you don't you just walk. Wow. You don't need a bicycle. Um, so then it's like, okay, this is pretty cool. Um, and, you know, so, so young people could be in Berlin Apartment and still, you know, can work at Gabriel. And but if you want to have more of a family situation, the backyard, there's you know, affordable housing available with you know, houses with yards and stuff that aren't too expensive. Um, yeah, um, so it, it seems like a good, good, good combination of factors. Um, yeah, a lot of talent you know, in the area, so um. Oh, it, it sounds cool to Google in. It, 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 it does sound like some some cool nightclub, I think. <laughs> you, know, you could definitely have a cool nightclub that was called that. People were like, yeah, that sounds good. Giga, Giga Shanghai, too. It sounds pretty cool. You know, pretty we fun. should party in Giga Shanghai. Yeah, yeah. yeah we should have like a rave cave in the... <laughs> There's a lot of space around the factory side. Yeah. yeah. But well, you should have like your own nightclub. Yeah, <laughs> I think that'll be who who doesn't know. <laughs> who doesn't want to work? We should do that. I feel like I'd go for sure work at a company with has got the nightclub. <laughs> that sounds way more fun. Didn't you want to put a roller coaster into the Fremont factory? Yeah. So, yeah. You still gonna do that? I mean, I think that would be pretty fun to do. <laughs> yeah. I think I think we could just like do um, yeah, just basically have like. We just needed a, a, a rail that can support like a modified t- modified Teslas, and then and then yeah. Oh my god! Can yeah. you imagine a plaid plaid? Oh, yeah, just like zip around and <laughs> around the factory in like five seconds. <laughs> Doors would be booked for months. <laughs> yeah, we should get in right now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we, we kind of actually in various parts of the factory we have vehicle conveyance systems. They just don't move that fast, but they're kind of like roller coasters that move you slowly. Speed them up. Yeah. yeah, you can speed them up. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, um, but yeah, we're all feeling pretty. You know, we weren't uh, tent fate or anything, but feeling pretty good about where things are headed. Um, and. Um, I think there's just a, lot, a lot of good things, you know, Model Y coming out this year and um, some exciting announcements about batteries, uh, a lot of progress in autopilot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, building Giga Berlin um, and, um, and then making progress on some of the new vehicle developments uh, and solar, the solar roof, solar glass roof, getting the, that rolled out. Um, the Cybertruck got received really well, I think. Yeah. 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 Did you expect that many uh, orders? Uh, not, no, not really. Yeah, it's um, amazing. <laughs> no, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when I first saw the Cybertruck and I, in, in the Francis Design Studio, I mean, you know, you know, had told me that this was a this was a, a daring design. I, although I think you're the most excited about this design than any design. Yeah, I thought it, I think it's our best product ever. Yeah, and I saw it. I was just taken aback, it, and not not by the design so much by the pure aggression that the truck. Mm-hmm. You stand in front of it, and you're like, okay, I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, it really is like a badass truck. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it seems like like the a lot of reasons why people buy pickup trucks, uh, you know, in the U.S. is like because it's like the most badass truck you know like yeah. like which one's the toughest truck and you know it's like the, what's tougher than a truck a tank <laughs> <laughs> like a tank from the future <laughs> so it's like a, my niece in Cochrane which is near Calgary she 
he's a dirt bar rider champion. And already five cyber trucks were ordered just the day. Five cyber five. trucks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just in case the first four are busy. <laughs> yeah, five of her friends ordered. She's definitely. And she's also pretty Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They just love it. Yeah, it's, it's literally like, so how do you out tough a truck? You just make a futuristic armored personnel carrier, and that's the tougher than a truck. And I feel like autonomy <laughs> will probably be very, like, mature by the time it ships, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, for sure. So, so how many Cybertruck orders do we have right here? Raise your hand. I got one. one. Two. We all have <laughs> Two. I ordered three. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's going to be pretty special and not look like other things, so, you know. Yeah, it looks so cool. Like the first time I show it to my son, it's like, "Daddy, this is something from Alien." <laughs> that is, this is his first impression. Yeah. It's like, yes, it is. That's that's how it was designed. It was, it's like, what's the, you know, let's let's make a future futuristic armored personnel carrier, you know, and so the inspiration board was like. Literally, like, you know, Blade Runner, yeah. you know, uh, like sort of Mad Max, uh, Back to the Future, yeah. uh, you know, um, Aliens. Aliens. You know, like, yeah. Um, so, so that's why it looks like the, that. Yeah, like, like the pre-order number is amazing. Well, it's got to be over like 400,000 now, right? I think, we I, mean, I think it was just so risky and it just, like, at first people were like, even people who, like, were hardcore fans were like, oh. This yeah, when I first rolled out, and then people are like, you know what? "Wait a minute! Like, yeah, uh -huh. this is kind of amazing. I want this." You could see it like there was like a, in person. You could see it happening really yeah. fast. It's like scrolling. The, the reaction and then the processing. And then you're seeing all the features and then the range and the price. Those are the compelling things that really like just hit everybody. Yeah, really. The forty thousand was the biggest shocker. Yeah. It's like, oh, people are going to be buying. And, this. and that range too. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just no, actually the sixty nine thousand. 500 miles with 2.9 seconds. Like, come on. Like, come on. <laughs> Dude, you have to get it. <laughs> no way. Yeah. yeah totally. it's well, amazing. Sid Mead loved it too, right? He did, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the last things he said, actually. Let's, yeah. Did he have a drive in it? And no, he saw pictures of it, but I think he was not. Obviously, he died recently, so he yeah. didn't. Uh, he, saw, he saw pictures and he said, Yeah, that's great. And he said, Send us a note. Like, he loves it. You know. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, you want you want to have these things that inspire people. It feels different. Not like everything else is like the same. It's like variations on the same theme. You want to have something different. I, I but you say like how many? I wasn't sure if nobody would buy it or a lot of people would buy it. <laughs> yeah, it just wasn't. You know, didn't, I don't know. But, but you know, we. I just told team like, listen, if nobody wants to buy this, we can always make one that looks like the other trucks. That's not like yeah, yeah. You can always just try it and uh, yeah, just, uh, say like, okay, feel. it was a you know, we could say okay, it was a weird failure, but now <laughs> we'll now we'll make one that looks just like the others, and <laughs> there you go. So it seems to have captured the whole world though, like elevated Tesla and the cultural zeitgeist in a way that like is so exciting. Like the Travis Scott music video yeah. already happened. Like that, yeah, was, that was so, cool. that I was, was waiting cool. for the first music video it's and like I was like, right yeah, so yeah. awesome. Really cool. Yeah. Um, it's going to be hard to make that by the way. So it's not, it's because, it, because it's a different architecture, it's an exoskeleton architecture. So, um, there isn't any cars out there that have an exoskeleton architecture. Mm -hmm. So you've you got to rethink how the, all the internals of the car are done um, so that you can use the external shell as, as, as a load-bearing structure instead of just basically thin sheet metal that is effectively just there for aerodynamic reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you could take, you, you could take the, the external, the, the, what's called the A-class services of most cars and still drive around with, with, it lose almost no structural value. Mm -hmm. a, they usually go very, very thin sheet metal, so it's it's all end, endoskeleton. So um, there'll be some you know, some challenges building that. It's a Starship's three. It's a Starship's. Yeah, ships, yeah. So you can use the same steel as the ship. Yeah, yeah. I'd love one of those limited quantity ones. Oh, I <laughs> sure. know. Like so Tim had shout out it out. Yeah, about, Tim. Yeah. Tim had asked about that. Everyday astronaut. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He is a cool guy. He really knows what he's talking about. Yeah, he does. Um, so, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a lot of you know, a lot of good things. There'll undoubtedly, be some 
you know, setbacks along the way. But it's it's looking looking pretty good. Should we do some closing thoughts? You know, I just remember when I got my Model 3, it was like a difficult time in my life and it made it easier. And, you know, you don't have to buy gas, car drives you around, it just makes your life better. All of our lives in these little ways, like all this struggle you do, it, you know, it, it really makes things better and just makes you hopeful and inspired. And, you know, I just can't thank you and the whole Tesla team and uh, enough for for all the love you put into the car. You know, every day, it's just happy because I have a Model 3. That's cool. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. That's our goal. Our goal is to, you know, maximize the... We make people, like, really touch people's heart, you know, with, with the product. And it's, uh, like, I think, like, too many of these companies out there, they design these things with it's sort of a spreadsheet and sort of marketing surveys and that kind of thing yeah. without saying, do you love it? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, do you, do love you the actually product? like the product that you're making? Do you it love touched it? my heart very much. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I like to thank you for this chance, like doing interview with all of us. And um, as a shareholder and um, Model Three owner, um, I remember like one time you tweak about your money is first in and will be last out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was really touched yeah. to see that tweak. I think it's like years ago. Sure. Like right after one of the shareholder meeting. Mm-hmm. I was like, like which CEO would do this, you know? Mm-hmm. And like um, after I bought my Model Three, I'm more believed to the company. Like I ordered a Model Y and then two Cybertrucks. truck. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'm a Porsche fans before, and then right now like he was gonna get a Taycan until he saw the range. Yeah, I I was thinking to get a Taycan. Like why not? Like give it a try. But sure. when you look at the spec, the the range right. turned me off. Like. Yeah, and it's obsolete too. already. Two oh one, like who's gonna buy it for one hundred fifty k? As well, uh, just not talk about money. Just talk about <laughs> <Yeah>. range itself. <laughs> the spec, it's like it's not there yet. Yeah. So with like one hundred fifty k plus, like nobody gonna buy it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Elon. And uh, absolutely, yeah, thank you very much. Well, yeah. Well, thank thanks you guys for your support. It really makes a difference. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I don't own a Tesla, so I hope, hopefully, I will. Um, in you like, ordered a Cybertruck, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to- true. Yeah. Um, and your shareholder. Are you still in college? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. yeah, I've got to save up. Um, okay. But I will buy one. And I've got a Cybertruck, like you said. Yep. But um, like I've, made, I've made so many great memories just like through these cars. Like I've met all you guys <laughs> through Tesla. And this is like amazing, just like what kind of community um, just yeah. is created through products that you love. Mm-hmm. And I think that really means a lot. Like, I don't, I've, I think I've never seen people being so excited about a product before. Yeah. And like having this whole family feeling is really cool. cool. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say congrats, first of all, because I feel like this has been, it's kind of like a feel good moment for Tesla, all that's happening. Yeah. And obviously, thank you because. Like you've inspired all of us. And I think there's not many things in the world that like people get pumped about that are positive about the future. Like I feel, really feel like we need that now. And so Tesla, like bringing us all together has been really awesome and really much needed, I think. Great. This is, this is really cool. I think I'd have to agree with what Gally said, just where Tesla is going. Um, you have a car that's actually making a difference with the clean energy, changing the earth, cleaning things up. I mean, it made me excited to see, and it, you're so efficient, and you can you actually get things the way you do it. You just I don't know, you, you get it done, <laughs> and and I trust you, and I trust the company, and I and it's it's I don't know it's such a passion. It's amazing. I don't know. I love, don't get get the words out. <laughs> We're sometimes but, a little late, but we get things. We get it done in the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Always deliver. Yes. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for your support. Well, I just want to say like how I described this, this podcast, like we kind of, it kind of just grew out grassroots. Right. And, um, I look at you as also part of the community. You're, you're as much third row as all of us. Right. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful you were able to come on this and also tell the yeah, story, absolutely. show more people. I hope we can do it again too. Cause there's, I'm sure there's going to be sure. things that come up that we want to set the record straight to yeah. and, and maybe have some celebrations too. So yeah, that sounds, sounds good. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of exciting things. Probably, like I said, probably some, 
you know, disasters and drama along the way. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's never 100% good. We'll but, be there to help. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, it's always good to get feedback. Like, you know, um, you know if, you would, if you're sure in my position, what would you do? Right. Um, like, a lot of times, like, I just don't know if something's wrong. I just don't even know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it has to, I have to learn it somehow, you know. Um, and then I'll keep, you know, try to figure out, okay, how do we deal with all these different issues? Um, you know, scaling service effectively is very difficult, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so that's like one of, it's like a mundane thing, but it's very important. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think the mobile service is incredible. And yeah. I mean, I've had, I'm on my fifth tussle now. Yeah. Um, not the last because I just keep upgrading them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so I have the last one, I, so I have a P100D um, Model S, which is outside right there. And um, yeah, I, I have the, the, I got the license plate, get Tesla. Yeah. I thought, yep, yeah, if you want it, uh -huh. I, I would love to give it to you. <laughs> so yeah, thank you again. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Elon, can you sign my Model 3? <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. And my Model S, too. <laughs> All right, cool. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.